Good evening, everyone. It's five past seven. Welcome to the Buying a Home in the Netherlands webinar. Um, my name is Kimo, and um, I've got two great gentlemen with me. Uh, maybe you can see them in the video. Um, if I can go from top to bottom below me, I see my colleague Ludo will be supporting us with answering some of the questions and managing the Q&A. And below that we have Cesar, who will actually be a partner in crime in sharing all you need to know about the mortgage world, finance and so on. Um, let's test this thing out. So um, what's good to know is that this session will be recorded and it'll be shared with you. So you don't need to record it or make any notes. Um, I would like to test and see if everyone can hear me and see me. So maybe pop a yes in the Q&A section because we'll be using that quite heavily during the rest of the session. So just pop a yes in there. Yes, perfect. Um, yes, great, 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 great. Awesome. Um, well, as you can see here, we have a bit of a calendar. First, we're going to share a little bit more about us because we do like to talk about us, but that's not what we're here for today. And uh, we're here to tell you a little bit more about buying a home in the Netherlands. So Cesar will share a little bit more about renting versus buying. And then I'll share a little bit more about the actual buying process. And then we'll have FAQ and a, a lot of time for Q&A because we're here to help you. Uh, we want to make sure that you get the most out of this session. So please pop your questions in the Q&A and we'll answer them. Don't pop them in the chat, pop them in the Q&A section. That's where we'll answer them. Um, Ludo will already answer some of the questions during the session. And if there's any remaining, which most of the time there are, because you guys like to ask questions, um, we will be answering them at the end of this session. Um, throughout the webinar, we'll also have a um, few questions that we'd like to ask you. Um, so I think, I'll let's see if this works. Um, so let's start off with this, uh, bear with me. We've got a, uh, no, the polls are not working. There are no polls in, ladies and gentlemen. That is very unfortunate, no worries. That means we can move on quite quickly. Um, we'll uh, maybe ask those questions at the end. Um, again, my name is Kimo, but um, I am not alone. I'm from Expert Housing Network. I'm the owner and founder of it. And I have a team supporting that will be helping with actually buying a home, managing the team and so on. Um, Giovanna is one of them. Ludo is on this call. Alana, Dominic and Philip is also on the call. He's listening in. So um, and if you decide to move forward with us, then one of these guys will most likely be helping you out. Um, there's a few other things I'd like to share a little bit about us. We are not real estate agents, so we do not are, or we are not real estate agents. We don't have a background in real estate. The majority of us have a background in psychology, arts, name, name it, um, and our focus is helping you find a home and feel at home. Um, why are we not real estate agents? Because we don't have a background in it, but also because we only focus on helping buy, with buying and renting. So we don't sell properties, we don't rent out properties. Maybe it's good to know is, is that buying and finding a home to rent is our main priority. So especially in this market with buying, uh, uh, it can be quite tough and challenging. So it's very easy for a real estate agent to say, you know what, instead of helping a client that wants to buy, I prefer to help a client that, that wants to actually sell a property. So um, um, not us, we're focused and we only support with actually getting you a home. Um, and then we charge a fixed fee, so no commission. Uh, we don't believe in you spending more if you're already paying more for a home. So that might be good to share. And we know what it's like to actually settle in a new country. In the previous slide, you saw that we are from all over the world. Giovanna's from Brazil, Philip is from Belgium, uh, um, Dominic's from the UK, Ludo has also been living in the US. So we know what it's like to settle and move to a new country. But enough about us. Um, the word goes to Cesar. Uh, thanks, Kimo. Thanks, Ludo, for having me. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm, I, I'm seeing chats coming in. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Cesar. I'm the uh, and owner founder of uh, uh, Mr. Mortgage. We're a mortgage brokerage firm and a mortgage advisory firm. Um, in front of you, you see, uh, you see our team, uh, uh, Robin, financial specialist. Uskan is our financial specialist. I am a financial specialist and we have our colleague Agla uh, responsible for our marketing. Um, yeah. That was about it, Kimo. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to reconnect. I love these earpods, oh, but sometimes okay. <laughs> they give me headaches. So I was like, I can't hear you, uh, yeah. Cesar. No I, I didn't know he wasn't 
he wasn't acting up. So I was like, oh, it's probably just me. Um, no. Perfect. I hope everybody heard me when I was giving the introduction. Um, awesome. Great. Thanks, Cesar, for the intro. Um, today's goal is to add value to you. Um, we believe in sharing information freely. Um, so again, we're here to add value to you and make sure that this webinar is worthwhile. Um, what is good to know is, is that there's people in different stages of the process. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to make a webinar that is relevant for the majority of the people. Of course, we might miss out some of the more detailed information, but that's what we're here for during and after the session. So please pop your question in the Q&A, but also we're not going anywhere. We're not leaving the country. So if you want to book in a free intake with us after um, this webinar for tomorrow or next week, please feel free to do so because uh, it's impossible for us to answer all of the questions. And maybe you wake up tonight being like, oh, I should have asked that. And then we'll be here for you as well tomorrow, next week. Um, let's start with a new slash. Um, it's already, of course, the second quarter, but one of the things that changed this year was the National Mortgage Guarantee. Um, this is something that will actually help you if you, for example, lose your job or lose a partner or lose a limb and you can't manage to pay off your mortgage anymore. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Um, but then if you are able to actually get that guarantee, then if you sell the house and you have a default on your mortgage, then that will be covered by the guarantee. So um, this is something that is applicable for properties with a purchase price up to 325,000 euros. Last year it was 310,000 euros. Next year it will most likely be higher. But please bear in mind that if you buy a property, the purchase price or the price that you're buying it for is leading in this. Um, you'll be able to get that guarantee up until a purchase price of 325,000 euros. So it doesn't matter how much mortgage you get. It doesn't matter uh, uh, if you pay everything in cash. Um, the most important thing is what you actually pay to the seller for the property. Um, yeah, that's the maximum mortgage guarantee. Cesar, might share a little bit more about the transfer tax? Uh, sure, uh, thanks. Um, uh, so transfer tax, a couple of things have changed uh, this year. Um, so in previous years, um, uh, if, you if you bought a home, you pay 2% uh, on transfer tax. Um, this year, things have changed. Um, uh, uh, first time home buyers have a bit of a, a, a bigger challenge uh, buying, buying their first home. Uh, so to, to help them, government has decided to uh, uh, yeah, to help them out. How they do that is if you're under 35 and you purchase a home uh, that's 400K or less, then you don't have to pay uh, transfer tax. Um, so in a scenario, and I'll give an example, if you buy a home of 500K, then uh, the transfer tax is 2%, uh, which means uh, 10,000 euros. Uh, if you buy a home, 400 for 400 K or less, you don't have to pay the property transfer tax. So that saves you a lot of money. Um, another detail, um, you need to be on the 35 um, uh, 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 to, to, to make use of this tax exemption. If you're already over 35, you cannot use it anymore. Um, I know that most of you are uh, 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 not uh, uh, single, uh, you have a partner. Uh, in such a scenario, uh, and you can see that in the uh, middle column, um, you can see that it, it one, if, uh, if one of you is over 35 or 35 or older, so in this example, Kate is 37, John is 33, um, you both buy 50% of that, uh, of your new home. Um, in this situation, Kate pays 2% over 50% uh, of her uh, share of the property and John pays 0%. So in effect, you are paying 1%. Um, uh, last scenario on the right side, um, let's say Kate already had an apartment uh, and already used the uh, tax exemption um, and buys another property together with John. Uh, then in that scenario, Kate again pays, uh, pays uh, 2% and John pays 0%, even though they're both under 35. Um, uh, what I know and what I expect is that um, everybody who tuned in will receive uh, the uh, presentation uh, and you see a button, a button on the uh, bottom of the uh, page. If you click 
uh, you will visit uh, uh, our website um, and you can play around with the numbers to see exactly uh, what is applicable in your situation. Perfect. Thank you, Cesar. Um, well, we'd love to learn more from you. Normally we ask you the question, and maybe this is something you can pop in the chat. Um, we ask you the question where you are in the stage of buying a home. Are you um, still in the orientation phase, not knowing what to do exactly? Have you started viewing yet, or have you submitted an offer, or have you got an offer accepted? Uh, please feel free to share this information in the chat, so we'll uh, be able to um, uh, cater the uh, webinar a little bit more to your, um, to your stage. Um, so let's focus on that question. Um, we'll continue. We'll be able to check into the, the chat here and there. Renting versus buying, Cesar. Yes. Um, so it, it could be weird for me to say that uh, you should rent. Um, then it means that uh, I'm not earning any money. Um, still, I'm going to tell you why you should rent. Um, uh, what we usually here is that most of you attend this webinar because they uh, find their rent uh, too high. Um, however, benefits of renting, uh, uh, you can leave your home, uh, usually within a year uh, or uh, within a month, uh, depending on the contract that you have. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, you're not responsible to pay any property taxes. You don't have to maintain uh, the, the home that you're renting uh, and there's no uh, down payment required. So that is giving you a lot of uh, benefits. Um, uh, downsides of owning your home, uh, you need to uh, pay taxes, property tax, you have the annual property tax, you have the initial uh, uh, taxes that you pay. Uh, you need to maintain your home and it could be harder to move because you would need to sell your home before you could, you could move. Um, so that those could be reasons to uh, uh, to rent uh, a home. Um, knowing all of this, uh, a quick question, maybe uh, some of you could uh, pop it in the in the chat. Um, are you still interested in buying a home? Is that still something you want to move? Uh, you want to do? Uh, we already see a couple of people answering it. Um, people leaving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, ah, I saw one maybe, that's interesting, but uh, I think 99% is saying uh, uh, yes. Um, why you should buy? Um, it gives you stability uh, in a sense that you don't have to deal with a landlord. Um, you don't have to deal with increasing rents. Um, so that gives you a lot of stability because you know exactly what you're paying. Um, you're going to, so when you, when you, when you, when you rent your home, um, you're basically losing that money because you will never see that back. You're simply paying a fee to live in that home. With a mortgage, it's different. Uh, so when you own a home, obviously you're paying your mortgage, but uh, a part of that uh, is creating equity and because you're repaying your debt. And if you sell your home against uh, the same price, then in the end, you'll receive that money back. Um, Another benefit, uh, Dutch government uh, wants their citizens to, to own uh, uh, homes um, and how they uh, uh, try to support uh, homeowners is by uh, giving them a, a deduction on their uh, mortgage interest. So there's a tax benefit to it. Um, so those are the benefits, uh, downsides of renting your home, uh, rents keep increasing. Uh, there are no tax benefits and you're not creating any wealth. Um, just a quick example of uh, to show you what, what it means uh, uh, when you compare the numbers. So in front of you, you see two uh, more or less similar properties on Gerard Douwstraat in Amsterdam in the Pijf. Um, uh, the, 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 on the left side, you see uh, uh, what you pay on rent every month, uh, 2,250 euros. Uh, when you recalculate it to a year, that's 27,000. Um, when you would buy a similar property in the same street, uh, we saw an asking price of 525. Um, uh, I obviously don't know uh, uh, what the selling price is, but just to give you an example of how you could approach this, 
Um, so 525,000, um, let's say you borrow 100% because that is uh, possible as long as your income is uh, sufficient. Um, with an interest rate of 1.58, currently we have lower interest rates. Um, then, so with a mortgage of 525, uh, duration of 30 years, interest rate of 1.58, you're paying 1,832 per, per month. That's already uh, 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 418 euros less per month. So you're already saving in the monthly payment. Then uh, what, what most people do is they compare uh, how much money they are burning away in a sense that the rent that you pay is money that you'll not see back. So that's money burning away. Um, you could compare it to the interest that you pay on your mortgage. Um, in the example that, that, that is shown over here, um, that number is 691. So of that 1,832, almost 700 euros is uh, interest. Um, so that means that uh, 1,100, to keep it simple, so 1,800 minus 700 is uh, 1,100, is the amount uh, that uh, uh, is used to build up equity. Uh, when you compare the difference of 2,250 versus 691, uh, uh, there, there is a difference. Uh, looking at the closing fees, so that th those are the initial closing fees that you pay. Uh, this number includes the uh, 2% uh, transfer tax. Uh, even then, you're still hitting a break-even uh, point in 15 months. So this example shows that if you uh, live in your home for at least 15 months, obviously that's a really short term. Um, I advise that you should, should only buy a home if you stay in your home or expect to stay in your home for at least three years. Um, then it financially, it makes sense to, to buy a home. Um, looking at, um, so, I already mentioned you're, you're paying back your mortgage. Let's say you're living in your, in your home for five years. Then the remaining debt is 453K. Uh, so if you sell your home after five years, then uh, um, uh, you'll receive 71K on your bank account. Obviously this is simplified. Um, you'll probably pay a, 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 a fee to uh, the notary that's handling all the paperwork uh, and you'll pay uh, uh, someone to sell your home. So it'll be slightly less. However, this gives you a good indication of what could happen in five years. Perfect. Thanks, yeah. Cesar. Um, we started this webinar off with about 103 people. There's still 102 people in or 100 people. So that means that people are still interested in buying a home. Um, yeah. Let's move on to the next part, because Cesar just talked a little bit about the closing fees. Um, in order to buy a home, you need to take into account several closing fees or purchase costs. We'll go over them. Um, the first one, transfer tax. Cesar mentioned this. If you're 34 or younger, and if it's the first time that you're buying a home, or if you're buying a home below 400,000 euros, do the calculator, do the check with them, and then you'll be able to uh, save some of that money. If you're a little bit older, or if you've already benefited from the uh, exemption uh, rule, which is very unlikely, because uh, it'll most likely be your second home, or if you're buying a home to invest in, then the transfer tax goes up. Um, take into account that you'll be paying 2% then. Um, and what we'll see is in the third column, we've said if the amount that you're paying as closing fees are tax deductible. What this means is at the end of the year, you have to file for taxes and your taxable income can be lowered by some of these amounts. Um, one of them, for example, is the notary fee that you're paying for the mortgage deed. Um, why is this tax deductible? Because the government wants to motivate you to get specialists on and get good services when it comes to mortgages. It's a difficult, it's a complex product. So you wanna make sure that you get somebody on to help you out um, and therefore they give you some benefits to actually get some money back on it. Um, so the notary, that's part of it. The notary also, drafts the transfer deed. Um, this has nothing to do with your mortgage. This is the deed that gives you the ownership over the property. Um, and these are the fees. Please bear in mind that the fees are different per location. So if you go to more rural areas, you'll pay around 600 for the mortgage deed, 600 for a transfer deed. If you go to some of the 
uh, bigger cities, then you'll pay a little bit more. Um, you also pay for a bank or a mortgage broker. These are tax deductible. And then you'll pay for a real estate agent if you, of course, want support with buying a home. The typical fee that real estate agents charge is 1% to 2%. And this is for actually helping you purchase a home. And um, we put in small letters that EHN charges a fixed fee. We don't believe in commission like that. Um, and then you'll also pay for the appraiser. The appraiser charges anywhere between 550, 600, depends a little bit. If you get a new build, they charge a little bit more. If it's a bigger property, they charge a little bit more, but this is what you can kind of expect. Um, the appraiser is necessary to actually secure a mortgage, the appraiser report, so this is tax deductible. Then you'll have the technical inspector, they'll come in to inspect the property. Um, and then you have an interpreter, which is mandatory by Dutch law to have at the final stages. So somebody that can actually translate the transfer deed, the mortgage deed, so you know what you're signing for. And then you'll have the bank guarantee, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then if you won't want to apply for the national mortgage guarantee, you'll pay 0.7% of the mortgage amount and it is tax deductible. Um, so in order to start the process, make sure you've got some money in savings. I would advise in this current market to have a little bit more money in savings than just the closing fees because it's relatively competitive. Um, or relatively, it's quite competitive. Um, but either way, if you want to start, then make sure you have this amount. If you don't have to pay transfer tax, take into account that the amount is anywhere between two to three percent of the bridge price in total. And if you do have transfer tax, it's closer to four, five, sometimes even six percent of the bridge price, what you'll have to pay in total in purchase fees. Um, then we'll share a little bit more about who you will meet during the process. Um, first, you'll meet the notary. The notary drafts several contracts um, he is kind of like the legal glue between you and the seller um, and he's also an independent party even though you'll pay for him because the buyer's cost as they say or the purchase costs are for the person purchasing the property and the notary is part of that um, in amsterdam they'll also draft the bridge contract outside of amsterdam the selling agent will draft the bridge contract that's the first one that's the contract between you and the seller stating that you'll buy the property the seller sells the property under these conditions. Then the notary will draw off the mortgage deed and a transfer deed, which is a little bit closer to the final stages of the purchase uh, process. Um, the notary will come into play after your offer is accepted, so not before that, and he'll create these legal documents. Then we'll have Michelle, the appraiser. She'll come in as soon as you've got an offer accepted. A lot of people ask me, um, do we have to get an appraisal in before so we actually know what the actual valuation is? No, that's a waste of money because the majority of you will not get their first offer accepted. Um, some of you might, super lucky, which is great, but it's a very competitive market out there at the moment and you'll only want to know the final amount or the actual value of the property as soon as you get an offer accepted because you'll need it for the mortgage. Um, she'll come in to the property and take a few photos, ask a few questions about the majority of the work she does behind her desk, behind a computer. What does she do? She checks reference properties, properties that have been sold in the last six to 12 months um, and that are similar and in a similar neighborhoods. Um, the process of getting a mortgage or getting a, a appraisal report or evaluation report takes anywhere between three to seven days. Why does it take that long? Because it has to go to an independent institute called the NWWI. They validate if the mortgage uh, or if the appraiser has played by the rules and if the evaluation report is um, uh, correct. Once they've said yes, then you'll be uh, able to actually uh, forward it to the mortgage advisor, uh, forward it to Cesar and his team, and they'll add it to the application for your mortgage. Then we'll have Millie, the building inspector. Um, she's not legally required. Um, the, the appraiser in the previous slide is in order to get your mortgage, but Millie is more for people that buy a property that's maybe not brand new. And especially if it's a little bit older, you want somebody to come in to actually inspect the property and say, okay, hey, this, this is a great property, but please bear in mind, have a look at this, have a look at that. It's a visual inspection. So they're not gonna tear down walls or open up pieces. They'll bring a lot of tools to check, for example, humidity behind the walls, um, if the floor is level, all that stuff. Um, and they'll give you a report within well, two business days. Um, I would always advise to have somebody come in that understands construction. Um, even if you get support from us or another buying agent, we'll be able to pick out a lot of the stuff, but we are not construction experts. So um, get somebody in, especially if you buy a property that's, uh, well, the majority of the property are, are expensive or are a lot of money and you don't want to find out 
three months after you've moved in that you need to redo the roof or that there's a major leakage. So um, um, please be careful and do your due diligence. Um, then we'll have Robin. Robin, great guy. He's one of Cesar's team. What he will do, he will share more information about mortgages with you. Cesar will share a lot already today, but I think you'll have tons of questions. Um, so they'll actually share information, relevant information with you, because I believe that it's important to make a good decision. I always kind of like compare a bank and a mortgage advice in the following way. The bank is kind of like a retail shop. You go in there, they'll try to sell you their products. Um, Cesar and his team don't really care which product you go for, as long as you are well informed and are happy with the decision and it fits your needs. Um, so they're kind of like more like your personal shopper, stylist. I, I know several love Cesar loves this, but um, um, that's what I believe. I think that is very useful and especially because it's tax deductible, the amount that you pay for a mortgage advisor, I would definitely recommend it. In these markets, the amount that you spend on a property is quite high. And if you get one or two decimal points difference because you get a good offer, I think that's worth it. Um, and they'll of course also submit the mortgage application. They'll not just give you advice. So actually do the work as well. They'll submit the mortgage application and they'll get it confirmed. I haven't had a single case actually, which didn't get confirmed. And I'm not sucking up to you, Cesar, just so you know. Keep, uh, keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> um, then we have a buying consultant. That's Alana, that's a colleague of mine. And what does Alana do? Um, I think the added value of Expert Housing Network or Alana, in this case, is not in finding you the right property, it's actually helping you secure the right property under the right conditions so that you don't buy something that is a surprise afterwards, a, a unpleasant surprise. What we'll do is we'll walk you through the process. We'll actually help with uh, scheduling new viewings, joining you to viewings. We can also support with a more remote package. Um, and I think one of the most important things is that we'll actually do property research and price research. We will find out what the appraiser will most likely value the property for. It's not going to be 100% accurate, but we'll get as close to that value as possible because that's important because the bank will only give you 100% of that value. So especially in a competitive market, getting close to the actual valuation of the property is key. So what we'll do is we'll look at information data of properties sold in the last six to 12 months that is similar. And it will also look at the condition of the property. We'll review the documents that are linked to the property. And then based on that, we can sit together and give a recommendation. Um, we'll also schedule third parties, notaries, appraisers, technical inspectors, all refer you to Cesar and his team. And we'll also review legal documents. So that's the bridge contract, the transfer deed, the statement of completion, which is the final invoice that you get from a notary, um, all that stuff. Um, those are the people you meet. Now, what does the timeline look like? As follows, um, you start to search and this, this bit is a little bit skewed because it can take a little bit of a while before your offer gets accepted. If not, you're lucky, that's great. If your offer gets approved, then you actually start doing your due diligence. So you get your appraiser in, you get the technical inspector in, and only then you sign the purchase contract. I would never advise you to sign the purchase contract before you've done your due diligence because there might very well be a situation where hey, you're surprised by what the technical inspector says and then you want to pull out and you can't anymore. Luckily, once you've signed the bridge contract, you have three days, three business days to kind of like cool off. And well, it's we call it the bedenk tight. Um, it's a time you can reconsider your decision. <clears throat> Let's say you wake up in the night sweating. You're like, oh my God, what did I do? Then you can pull out without giving any reason. You have to inform the selling party, the notary, us and everyone that's involved, of course. But um, um, you still have that time frame. Um, the guys from Expert for Mr. Mortgages, they'll actually start with the mortgage application. They'll do a lot of pre-work. So don't wait until you've signed the bridge contract to chat with them because they can prepare your case, well, almost to a full uh, before you actually sign the bridge contract. So that speeds up the process. Then there's an average of four weeks it takes to get your mortgage approved. Um, I'm going to let you in on something. Uh, the guys... <laughs> Mr. Mortgage, I would say the average is a week and a half, two weeks, um, no pressure, uh, but let's take enough time, especially if you have a challenging case, especially if you're from one of the risk countries or um, you're going through divorce or name it. Um, so please do take the time for that. Um, and then once your mortgage is approved, great, congratulations. Then everything is sent to the notary and the notary will share with you the final statement of completion because a lot of the purchase fees, the closing fees or the purchase costs that we reviewed earlier, will have to be paid just on the day of transfer or before the day of transfer. Um, so you'll incur some extra costs then. And since you won't be able to borrow that money from the bank, 
you'll have to pay some closing fees in the end to the notary's escrow account. Um, then on their transfer, you'll get the keys. Congratulations. You'll also uh, become the owner of a proud mortgage. And then you'll have uh, the keys to your castle. And then you have a few months, about two max to actually inform the selling party about anything that's broken that should have been mentioned, or should have been highlighted before or on the day of transfer. Please don't wait until the very last moment to notify the selling party. And uh, because the, the longer it takes, the longer you wait, the longer it takes, and the more difficult it becomes to prove that it was already the case when you've moved in. So double check. I don't expect you to bake a cake the first day that you're into the property, but please start using the property in the first few weeks. Um, and if there's anything that you need to notify the seller about, please do. There is always a situation where you, of course, have to show or have to make a reasonable accusation that it was like this on the day of transfer. Um, so um, if you need support, we'll be there. Whew. That's the timeline. That's the process. Those are the people you've met. That's the reason why you should rent versus buy. Um, we get asked several different questions. I think this is the place where Ludo will kick in and start asking these questions. That is correct. All right, the first question is for you, Cesar. Um, the question goes as following. Can I get a mortgage with a temporary contract or as a freelancer? Um, question we short, get short answer, uh, uh, yes, you can. Um, uh, it, it, I'll start with uh, be, being a freelancer. The bank's going to look at your track record. Um, the minimum track record that you need is 12 months. Um, and if you have a track record of 12 months, you cannot use that income fully. Uh, so they will deduct 25% uh, of your income, for example. And that's the amount that can be used for uh, the, the mortgage application. Uh, so you could start after, after 12 months. Uh, having a temporary contract, um, uh, yes, you can also get, get a mortgage if you have a temporary contract. There's one um, small detail. Um, so maybe, maybe uh, some of the, the uh, attendees have already uh, heard about this. So you need a so-called letter of intent or like a confirmation from your employer that um, you'll get, a, 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 you'll get a, an indefinite contract. Um, what we currently see uh, so th those um, uh, those statements or those confirmations uh, uh, are in a standardized uh, uh, form. Uh, so every employer needs to use that same form. Uh, that form has been updated. It's, it's being updated every uh, uh, six to nine months. And the latest update, update contains uh, an extra checkbox. If, uh, and that extra checkbox is if your employer is going to um, uh, extend your contract with, for example, another year, or uh, that they're going to give you a, an indefinite contract. If they're going to extend your contract for another year, for example, um, then uh, you could still get a mortgage, but the bank is going to look at your track record uh, instead of looking at your actual income. So that's good to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, but uh, once you, you, you prepare your mortgage, it's going to get easier uh, and you, you'll not be surprised. So that's the long answer. Short answer, yes, long answer is <laughs> I just told. <laughs> awesome. By the way, pop your, pop your questions into the Q&A because we'll answer some of the, or the majority of them after this FAQ. Next one. All right, and that question is for you, Kimo. Um, what happens if you want to leave the country after several years? That's a good question. We get asked that a lot. I think I have actual, actually a slide for that. Um, so there's several things you can do. Um, first, of course, you can keep your home, but you'll still have your mortgage cost. It's allowed to actually have a home while not living in the Netherlands here. Um, but you, of course, pay for the mortgage. Um, and it maybe becomes kind of like a pied de terre. I'm not sure if that's uh, the amount of um, money that you're going to spend for a pied de terre. But the second thing what you can do is you can actually rent it out. But please be mindful is that the majority of you will take out a residential mortgage, which means that the bank 
people need to give you permission to actually rent out the property. Um, they'll uh, sometimes do that. Cesar will share a little bit more about that. But please bear in mind that it's not just you leave, rent out the property, and everything will be fine because there's a risk involved if you do it without the permission from your bank. Um, of course, the third thing is you can sell your home. You don't have any capital gains tax. You don't incur any penalty for paying off your mortgage early. So um, I think Cesar mentioned it earlier in the presentation. Um, if you buy, don't buy for one year, one and a half year. If you buy, buy for several years because you'll uh, be able to break even or make some money off it, especially in the current market where people are overbidding more. Um, I would advise you to at least have your property for at least three to five years, um, if not longer. Um, but you can sell afterwards uh, without any penalty or capital gains tax. So those are the things you can do. Great. Then we have another one for you, Cesar. Um, how much can I actually borrow from the bank? Um, you can borrow either 100% uh, of the property's value, which is, uh, so the property is going to be appraised, mm -hmm. or you can borrow 100% based on what is affordable on your income. Uh, and you can borrow the lowest of those two. Okay. All right. Um, and then for you, Kimo, where should I actually buy a home? <laughs> I've been looking all over. Tell me. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, so the majority of you are buying a home, most likely in, in, in or near a city. Um, and there, there are several things I think you should look into. Um, but the very first and the foremost important thing is, is that is it going to cater to your expectation when it comes to quality of life, quality of living? That's the most important thing because you'll spend a lot of time in there, um, especially with the current COVID measures. Who knows what's going to happen at the end of this year? But also, like I've heard these stories so often, like people think like, oh, no, I'll stay here for a couple of years and then I'll sell or I'll move or I'll rent it out. And then it turns out they've stayed here for 10, 12, 15 years. Um, so you want to make sure that if you buy a property that you're happy with it, what does that mean? So what are your needs currently, but also what are your needs in a year or two years from now? Um, if I can go to like a private example, when I bought a property uh, with my partner, she was pregnant at the time and we were living on the third floors with the typical Dutch steep stairs, right? It was an actual climb. I had legs like this and now I have legs like this, which is much better. But um, um, we moved because we wanted to live like on the first or ground floor. And then we bought a property. It was already quite competitive back then. Um, and we bought a property and turned out that a couple of years in when our uh, little uh, little dragon, I call her, started to walk and run. We were like, oh, we would have loved to have that garden. We would have loved to have a little bit more room for the kitchen and so on. So I think it's important that you don't just look for what you look want, what you want now, but also in a couple of years. Um, then location is important, of course, because location will have an impact on both the quality of living, but also on whether it's an investment, it's a proper investment or not. And there are several things to look out for when it comes to location, of course. Um, look out for what the current market value and the value for money is. If it's already at the top um, of the valuation range or if it's very popular, um, then it might be more expensive to purchase because it's more competitive and the room for the value to grow might not be as much. Also look at things like facilities, amenities, is there a park nearby? Uh, are there shops nearby? What is the infrastructure like? So um, is it also easily accessible, for example, by tram, train, bus, metro, car, bike, name it. Um, those are more, well, very important things. And the other thing is, is um, I would, I always hear that um, in the underdeveloped areas where kind of like the creatives move to, that's where kind of like a lot of room for progress is and a lot of room for development is. So have a look at that as well, right? Like what are the areas that are currently underdeveloped but where you see a lot of development, where you see a lot of um, input when it comes to maybe new shops, new projects, a lot of creative stuff going on. That's where the buzz is and most likely you'll see that uh, value increasing. To give an example, um, which I think the majority of you will be looking in Amsterdam. So let me think about an Amsterdam example. Um, yeah, so we have a river that kind of like separates the north and the, the rest of Amsterdam. Um, the north of the river always was eyed or viewed like kind of, kind of, yeah, underdeveloped, maybe not as ideal. And what happened was a lot of the creatives, a lot of the new concepts went there. Um, and that was like five to 10 years ago. And now it's booming. And I think that that's something that you can look for in every city. 
Um, but first of all, quality of quality of life. Second of all, location, location, location. What are the amenities, facilities, so on, accessibility. And maybe third is look where the room for development is. Um, this differs per city, per area, per neighborhood, per uh, countryside. Um, and also don't forget to take into account, of course, what your uh, future plan is. And we're currently seeing a uh, increase of kind of like uh, exodus out of the major cities to places where there's a little bit more room. And honestly, I think that's a that's a wise decision. I also believe that the city is still lovely, especially for some of the younger folks, there's a lot of energy. Um, but I'm also taking into account that um, uh, we'll see some more increase of value, uh, maybe on the outskirts of the city, the more rural areas versus the, uh, versus the city centers. Ooh, that was a long answer. <laughs> cool. All right, next one. Uh, question for you, Cesar. Um, is it possible to, to rent out my house or, or part of my house? Uh, yes, you can. But as, as uh, Kim already mentioned, uh, uh, you need to have permission from your bank. Um, most of you will, uh, uh, when, when you buy a home, you'll get a residential mortgage. Uh, when you sign all the paperwork at the notary, you'll see a specific clause in the mortgage deed that you cannot rent out your home without the bank's approval. Um, um, that is mainly, uh, uh, and I want to share this, that's mainly because uh, tenants are well protected in the Netherlands. Um, that means that uh, even a bank, if there is a, 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 a tenancy agreement uh, that's indefinite, then even a bank cannot kick out that tenant from uh, the apartment or from the home. And that has a lot of impact on the value of that property. Um, so what the bank will, what, what banks will do is, and that's why they have this clause, uh, there are special uh, buy to let mortgages. Uh, um, and then you're supposed to uh, rent out your home. So that's, uh, uh, that's what you should get uh, uh, then, because that's, uh, um, if you don't do this, um, uh, I had a, a conversation with, with, a, with a client uh, this week, and she was telling me uh, 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 that uh, a lot of her friends are doing it, uh, 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 and, but this is without knowing the implications. Implications uh, could be you're penalized, uh, 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 another one is you can get uh, blacklisted uh, from that bank or even from other banks and uh, you're not making that much of a profit because the differences of the, uh, the two products so residential mortgage versus buy to let is not that much um, how much uh, is it? so looking at for example at a 10 years fixed term uh, a, a residential mortgage will have an interest rate of around 1.5. Uh, looking at buy to let, you'll pay around 2.2. So that difference, obviously, there is a premium. However, that premium is, in, in, in my eyes, uh, 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 not significant enough to take such a huge risk and lose your home, uh, uh, basically. Um, and usually, Looking at the, the apartments that are being rented out, you're talking about maybe 80 uh, euros per month. Mm. It's not a huge profit that you're making whilst you're taking a huge risk. So that's, uh, but you can rent out uh, your home. Um, looking at finding a roommate, because I know that some of you are uh, thinking about doing so, um, that's a lot easier. Uh, if you inform your bank that you want to, uh, uh, share your home uh, or your apartment with a roommate, then you'll get that approval as long as they know who the roommate is. So that's basically it. Okay. All right. And then back to you, Kimo. Question goes as followed. What's the typical amount I should overbid this crazy market we're living in? In the crazy market. Yes, that's for sure. Um, so this is a question that um, is very <laughs> I could I could say like this is a percentage, but it's never that, right? Because what you should be looking out for is the following. So 
selling agents will list the property for a specific price. Um, sometimes a selling agent is very opportunistic and they know what the market does. They know how people behave. So they're like, you know what? A property that's 300,000 euros. Um, it's actually valued at 300,000 euros. Why not put it up for 300,000 euros and see what happens? And then they get offers for 320, 330, 350, 360. And that would be great, right? Especially if they get offers that don't require a mortgage because the bank will only give you about 300,000 euros. Um, most agents don't put it up for 300,000 euros. They put it up for 250, 260 because they know the more people they get in, the more offers they'll get, the more they'll be able to kind of like drive the price up a little bit, but also the more they'll impress the sellers, their clients in this case. Um, so if you have those two agents, then if I tell you, you have to overbid by 10, 15%, then for agent A, you'll be overbidding by, what is it, 45,000 euros. And with agent B, you'll be overbidding by a lower amount, but you'll be close to the actual value, which in the current market is very difficult to get the property for the actual value. Um, so I can't give you that number. I do want to tell you that it's good to look out for what the market value is and then decide, okay, hey, how popular is it? Will I be spending some of my own cash on top of it or not? Um, and how to move forward when it comes to that. So there's no actual percentage. I can tell you we've had properties uh, or we saw we bought properties for people that we offered actually a little bit below the asking price. Not a lot though. The majority of them are actually bought for over the asking price, also over the value. How much it differs from five, 10, 15, I've even seen 20%. Today, um, um, we heard a property that was actually on the market before, was it six, 675, was sold for 100,000 euros more. Um, that's how crazy the market can be, but don't stare yourself blind on a specific percentage. I would like to tell you that you have to look for the market value and maybe keep some cash behind or uh, to actually offer on top of the actual market value because that will make your offer more attractive. Um, I, this probably doesn't answer the question, um, well, to some extent, but maybe not the answer you were looking for, but um, it is the truth. All right, for you, Cesar, what happens if I leave my job after I secure the mortgage? I'm also going to tell a personal story just like Kimo did. <laughs> I, I bought my first apartment when I was working at uh, ABN AMRO, um, one of the big banks. Um, then in 2016, I uh, left the safe nest to start the adventure of, uh, of, of Miss Mortgage. Um, I, I, I could pay the mortgage, so nothing happens uh, as long as you pay uh, your mortgage. So, yeah. We're very happy you made that jump to light speed. Yeah. <laughs> High five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, there was some talk about a deposit that needed to be made. Can you tell me a bit uh, what, the, what the actual 10% deposit is, Cesar? Yeah. <clears throat> um, could you could you go to the uh, slide with the uh, timeline? Uh, yeah, over here. Um, so we have that uh, big big dot of signing the purchase agreement, um, and you have the dot of the uh, um, mortgage application being approved. Um, so in the uh, purchase agreement, you're going to discuss a couple of deadlines. Um, so that uh, deadline of getting the mortgage application approved is actually a safety net for you uh, because if you cannot get the uh, mortgage approved, you can cancel the agreement and you don't have to pay the seller uh, a, a fine or a, a fee. Um, as soon as you sign the purchase agreement though, um, the seller and you are um, uh, you have a deal so the seller cannot sell his home to someone else or the seller needs to pay you 10% for canceling the agreement. Um, however, the seller doesn't know if you can get a mortgage approved. They don't know if you have a job. They don't know if you have cash. They don't know anything. They, so during, uh, between signing the purchase agreement and the deadline of uh, getting the mortgage approved, the seller has zero security. 
what, uh, what you will see, and this is standard, usually one week after the deadline of the uh, mortgage approval, um, you could imagine that the seller wants to have security as well. Um, and how you can give the seller security is by either transferring 10% as a deposit to the notary's account, or uh, you can get a so-called bank guarantee. Uh, and a bank guarantee is, is, is a letter from the bank stating that if you as their client backs out of the deal, then the bank pays the seller 10%. So that is giving the seller a lot of security. And that's the 10% deposit that we're talking about. I hope that was clear. Well, I think so. Cool. Then I have a question uh, for the both of you. Um, a question I think a lot of people have is what does um, um, COVID-19 or what kind of impact does it have on the housing, current housing market? Maybe Cesar, you would like to start? Uh, I, I won't discuss the housing market. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell more about how, how banks um, uh, acted um, and what has happened since, since then. Uh, Kimo will tell more about the uh, housing market. Um, so when it initially started, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about uh, December 2019, uh, in the Netherlands, not much happened. Um, in, uh, on the 16th or the 19th of March, uh, the first lockdown started uh, in the Netherlands. And then what we saw happening was that banks immediately increased uh, their interest rates by 0 0.2, 0 0.3, uh, because they didn't know what the impact would be. And if the country is in a lockdown, it means the economy is in a lockdown. So they really didn't know what to expect. Um, um, during two, three weeks, what we saw happening was also that um, our clients started uh, either canceling agreements or uh, they, they, they were telling us uh, uh, to, uh, that they were going to wait it out, see what happens. However, after two or three weeks, I, I think everybody started to realize that it's going to take longer um, uh, and that uh, 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 they, they realized how and where they live. And I don't know, it was this, this uh, uh, everybody started at the same time looking for new homes. Uh, so the uh, market exploded on our sides, even though uh, interest rates were higher than before. So that had little impact. Um, looking at how, how banks dealt with everything, um, you need to fill out more forms. They're going to ask additional questions uh, about your financial position. Uh, so there's a lot more paperwork than before. Um, uh, employers need to fill out more, more statements. So um, it has become uh, more difficult to, uh, to get a mortgage approved. Uh, but besides that, uh, so after that initial increase in interest rates, uh, rates started uh, slowly dropping again. And currently we have lower interest rates than uh, uh, a, a bit over a year ago. Uh, so before the first lockdown started. And that's mainly because European Central Bank uh, uh, is uh, 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 stimulating economies. Uh, banks can still borrow money uh, 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 with low, against low rates. Uh, so that is the biggest impact on uh, the mortgage market. So it's getting more, more and more difficult to get it approved. However, we still have low interest rates, uh, which makes it um, uh, attractive to uh, buy a home and borrow money. Thank you, Cesar. Um, Ludo, um, before I, I give my answer, uh, sorry for putting you on the spot like this, but um, <laughs> you've been you've been helping clients out now for for several months, and you've talked to a lot of them. And my question to you is: Do you uh, experience or hear of any kind of like hesitation because of what is going on with COVID at the moment when it comes to people buying a property? Do you experience that with with the clients you're helping? 
No, not really, to be honest. Um, I think it's actually the other way around, um, that it's, it's it's super busy at the moment. Um, it's, uh, well, like you always use as a very good example, is that people are starting to realize how important their home is, um, meaning that I am struggling to actually get a viewing spot uh, for, for my clients sometimes. Um, uh, so that, uh, I think, indicates how, how busy it is at the moment, um, meaning that... Um, um, yeah, it 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 does have impact, but I think on the um, on the upwards way, let's say. Yeah, yeah. No, I think and I completely recognize that, and I think that uh, the curve that Sever just described um, is is something similar to the uh, to the curve that we saw with um, uh, with people wanting to buy a home. Um, it's it started off not really understanding what the impact would be. So people were still continuing with buying a home until kind of like those lockdowns happened. And then suddenly we saw a bit of a drop and people were like hesitant. And then as soon as the end of spring kicked in and the numbers went down to, um, to, uh, uh, to reasonable uh, numbers, and we saw people open back up again. And then when we entered into kind of like early, early autumn, we saw things pick up quite heavily, actually, um, because people saw a new lockdown coming. Suddenly, they were very aware because they they were made aware in that first lockdown about the home that they lived in. They were also aware about the fact they couldn't spend any money on anything because they were in lockdown, so they were saving a lot of money. Um, and they opened their eyes and be like, "Hey, is this is this really what what I wanna or where I want to live while in lockdown?" I also think it had some maybe some relationship thing. So <laughs> before <laughs> lockdown, maybe said we need a little bit more space. Give me an extra room. Um, but um, um, we saw that, right? So first hesitation, then uh, uh, a bit of fear, and then we saw an increase. And we're still seeing that um, homes are becoming more important than ever. I think that um, when companies say, okay, hey, instead of you working in the office five times a week or five days a week, you can actually work in the office two days a week, and the rest you can work from home. Um, suddenly means that, hey, work from is nice, but, um, well, I worked from my sofa for the first little bit because the, uh, uh, the dining room table was uh, occupied by a partner. So, um, honestly, working a few hours on the sofa is not ideal. Um, and you want to have some space, right? I have a little daughter, so she ran around most of the time. So I wanted to have that extra room. I wanted to have that outdoor space. I wanted to have a little bit more peace and quiet, like I want to have nature nearby. So I think that people are orientating on what it's important for them. And um, with homes becoming more important than ever, uh, we're seeing a steep increase. Um, what the future will hold is very uncertain. I think that it can go both ways, right? Because like I said, the central banks are printing money like crazy. Um, I don't, well, I, there's never been this much money in circulation ever, I believe. Um, and at some point, the uh, government will have to governments will have to stop with all the measures, with all the uh, uh, subsidies and spending money, and just giving money away to companies, for example, that maybe don't need it or should actually go bankrupt because the business is no longer um, viable. Um, and then we'll see a bit of an impact. I think that people will have plenty of money in savings for now, but who knows what's going to happen when that uh, uh, cap is, uh, is closed and maybe we'll see a little bit of inflation and so on. So um, the actual impact of that aren't certain because we don't know when that will happen. If I would have a glass ball, guys, I would be sitting on a beach right now. I would still give this lovely webinar, but um, uh, I would be doing something completely different. So I don't know exactly. I do know that there has to be some repercussion at some point. In what way, in what market, what segment, in what? Um, uh, if, you, if you saw a video from me on YouTube, about a year ago, I, uh, uh, I forecasted that we would see a, a decrease in the housing value because of, uh, because of the repercussions of this. So please take it with a pinch of salt what I say. I also say, uh, full disclosure, I'm not a, a seeker or I don't have that glass ball, but I do think that we'll still, well, we can still expect something to happen. On the other hand, what I've seen in the last year is that suddenly digitization has become more important than ever. Um, and maybe you're, I'm not sure if you're following it, but one of the things that is a big, big thing on at the moment is blockchain and crypto. Like, I don't want to like, like, like tell you all about it because I'm not, not informed enough, but I do know that we're seeing a dispersion, dispersion in a lot of things. We saw a dispersion in 
for example, content, because suddenly you can actually see it from your own server. We're going to see a dispersion of um, education because instead of going to university, you can take all your classes online. So they take out the middleman. I think the same thing is going to happen when it comes to, for example, um, home ownership, because right now home ownership is only for the very few because you need to earn enough money to get that mortgage to buy a home, right? Why is that? Because you'll have to actually pay for that full amount uh, uh, yourself with a mortgage. If at some point we can decentralize or democratize home ownership, I think that's going to have a big impact on the value of properties because suddenly instead of the very few having an impact or having interest in the housing market, we'll be able to give access to a lot more people to actually own a part of a home or a full home. Um, and I think that that is one of the uh, impacts that COVID had as well. Digitization has gone or like skyrocket. And I think that we'll see implementation of that in the next three to five years, um, maybe a little bit longer, but I do think that's going to have an impact on the housing market as well. So first, maybe we'll see a little bit of a dip when the repercussions are felt actually, then things are going to skyrocket again. And honestly, I've never heard anybody say, oh, I'm so happy I didn't buy a house 10 years ago. Um, and I think that's going to be the case moving forward as well. Um, the more people on this earth, the, uh, the less houses, uh, well, especially in, for example, the Amsterdam and the Netherlands area, we're not very good at building enough homes. So we'll have a shortage anyways. And the more people will be interested, the more the price will go up. Um, again, don't buy a house for one or two years, buy a house for a long run because um, when this dip might happen, it might be just when you want to sell that house. And if it's in one or two years, then you want to be able to weather that a little bit and um, maybe sell at a different stage. So um, um, there's plenty of other things that uh, we could like link to COVID, but I think that uh, my answer has been long enough. Um, and I'm happy to share more of my thoughts on a one-to-one -one session, or maybe in a future video, a YouTube video, who knows? Maybe I have it right this time. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> All right, question we get asked a lot as well. Um, let's start uh, with you, Cesar, on this one. Can you tell me a little bit about your fees? You know, we, we work with a fixed and flat fee uh, of 3,250 euros, and that fee is uh, tax deductible. Uh, we have a couple of services, so maybe uh, it's worth uh, uh, taking a look at our pricing page on our website. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, we also work with a, with a fixed fee. Um, we have two different packages. One is a remote package, so it will be your virtual assistant. We'll still guide you through the process. We'll still do the price research, property document review, uh, review all the legal documents, submit the option on your behalf, and so on. Um, we charge 2,000 euros, including VAT for that. We also have a package that actually means that we'll book in the viewings, we'll actually attend the viewings. It's the, the difference between two packages is one is we're not there in real life to hold your hand, the other we are. Um, sometimes it helps, sometimes you feel more comfortable actually having someone to join you on those viewings. Um, if you're a little bit more comfortable, independent, and you've been on plenty of viewings already, then the smart package might be useful, which is 2000. The complete package where we attend is 4,800 euros, including VAT. Um, yeah, those are the fees. All right, cool. Then we have reached my favorite part, <laughs> which is the Q and A. Um, I already took the liberty to answer a few questions. I saved some um, also because I think uh, the majority of the people will um, uh, will like these questions as well. Uh, we'll start with uh, a question. Uh, well, I think uh, for both of you, but I'll start with Kimo. It's from. Emilia, please uh, excuse my pronunciation. Uh, you talked a little bit about the mortgage guarantee, the national mortgage guarantee. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that for covering the payments after you have already purchased the house, for example? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, and by the way, like if you if you guys have any more questions, pop them in the Q and A. Uh, Luda loves them, and uh, <laughs> uh, he might even answer some of them. Um, the national mortgage guarantee is a guarantee in case you have to sell your property because you can't pay your mortgage anymore, and your property is something we call underwater. It's very typical for the Dutchies because the majority of the country is underwater. But um, let's say you buy a property for three hundred thousand euros. You get a mortgage for 300,000 euros. And then when you want to sell the property, it's not worth 300,000 euros anymore. It's worth 275,000 euros. And then that deficit will be covered by that mortgage guarantee. 
Um, in most cases, when, for example, you need to sell, most likely something will have happened, right? For example, I, I called uh, a few things out. Maybe you lose your job. Maybe you lose a spouse or you lose a limb so you can't work anymore. Of course, these things don't regularly happen and we hope they don't happen to you. But in those extreme cases, it's good to have this mortgage guarantee. It does cost you a little bit of money. It costs you 0.7% of the mortgage amount, but it also saves you money because the interest rates for these banks are lower. So the interest rates from the banks, maybe such you could share a little bit more about what the interest rates are for mortgage guarantee mortgages. Yeah, so I, um, I already mentioned um, uh, the, the 10 years fixed rate for residential mortgage is around uh, 1.5. Um, the the, the uh, rate for a mortgage, an uh, NHE mortgage, would be around 1%. So you're saving uh, 0 0.5 per year. That's good money. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Perfect. Okay, cool. I'll move on to the uh, next question. Um, it's from Aranya. Aranya asks, um, are the final purchase prices for a house published anywhere? Maybe for you, Kimo. Yeah, um, yeah, they are published. There's this um, uh, register called the Land Registry, and most of the time they're published a month, two months later. Um, because and, then, and by a month, two months later, I mean after the uh, transaction has taken place. So let me give an example. You submit an offer today, it gets accepted. Congratulations, and you sign the purchase contract in two weeks. Then you need about a month, month and a half to arrange everything. And then the seller says, I need another month or a month and a half to um, move all my stuff out and transfer. Um, so that's already like three and a half months in. And then, well, you'll have to wait still another month or two months before the data is available. So it always lags behind a little bit. Sometimes it goes a little bit faster, but the majority of the properties will be in the land registry um, and several months or one to two months after the transfers take place. So that's where you can find a lot of the purchase prices. Um, it is a little bit of a puzzle, but you can definitely find them. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then I um, have a question for you, Cesar. Um, it's regarding the transfer tax. Um, the transfer tax, if you want to stay, you're going to live there yourself, it's 2%. If you want to rent it out, correct me if I'm wrong, it's around 8%. Um, yeah. What is the actual minimum stay of living in the house to be considered living in it? For example, if I want to live in the uh, property for two years and after that rent it out, yeah. would I still pay the 2%? Okay. Um, there's no clear statement from the tax authorities. Um, that's the short answer. Um, <laughs> obviously, if, if you've been living there for two years and you decide to live somewhere else or you got a job offer somewhere else, uh, then uh, uh, you could point out that it makes sense to keep the property, for example, and you rent it out. And then the tax authorities will, will not chase you to, to pay that remaining 6%. Um, however, if after one month you decide uh, to, 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 to move away to rent it out, then uh, I can guarantee that tax authorities will chase you for that uh, remaining 6%. What's, what's good to know, um, uh, so the standard rate is 8%. However, you're getting a discount when you buy your own home of 6% or 8%. So the standard is eight. Okay. All right, cool. Um, and then uh, for you, Kimo, we were talking a little bit about uh, closing costs and all that. Is there a way to raise capital for those costs um, by a mortgage or anything like that? Uh, yeah, there, there, there is. So I think the, um, the mortgage normally doesn't cover that amount. But let's say you have the luck of purchasing a property that is, well, again, let's move to the 300,000 euros property that is valued at 300,000 euros, but you're able to get it for a bargain of 275,000 euros. Then the bank will give you 100% of the value of the property, which is 300,000 euros, and then you'll be able to actually pay some of the closing fees for that money. It's very rare that, that happens. Um, if you do, let me know, please, because I've congratulated personally. Um, but um, um, it, is, it is possible. We've had it happen, I think, one or two times this year so far. Um, but um, um, yeah, definitely. By the way, I just noticed that uh, we're three guys in here. So next time we either one of us needs to wear a wig or we need to get some feminine energy in here. <laughs> it's not very I diverse. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Go. 
Okay, cool. Then um, um, I have another question for uh, for you, Kimo. Um, it's a question from Sahim. Uh, he or she asks, my buying lacklar or my buying agent is selling an apartment that I like. Um, it's not the same guy from the same company, or it's, it is the same company, but it's not the same person um, handling the property. But I still have chances to get the house, or do I need something from a legal perspective? So technically, a, a buying agent or an agent is not uh, allowed to represent both parts of the um, uh, of the, of the equation. So not the seller and the buyer. So ask them if this is, a, for example, the freelancer that is managing the uh, the property, or if it's actually the agency that has an agreement with the seller. If it's the agency, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to get support from that agency to buy that property. What you can do is you can, of course, buy it yourself. Like, don't get any help, or you can get us on board. Um, so you know where to find us now. Um, but um, um, that's unfortunately the case. Well, not unfortunately. It's good because you don't want one party representing both because they'll not be independent anymore. Cool. All right. Then um, another one for you, Cesar. Um, a question from Julia. If you have a temporary contract and you work on uh, or at an institution, for example, the European Commission, who does not provide a letter of intent, can you still get a mortgage then? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, so there's another way of looking at uh, uh, applicants at banks, and that's based on your um, uh, your track record, your position, your knowledge, experience. Um, but I can already tell you that the process of Kimo mentioned, we can get mortgages approved within two weeks. This is not a case that I will take on and uh, tell you that we're going to finish it in two weeks. <laughs> That's, uh, it's going to take longer. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, then uh, right back to you, Kimo. Question from Ella. Can you please share some insights regarding buying a new, about, new built house versus an um, well, already built house? Yeah. Are there any pros or cons? Yeah, good question. Um, so when you buy a new build, well, of course you'll buy something that has a better, or is a better quality than something that was built 100 years ago. Um, maybe different charm, but better quality, higher energy label, most likely thicker insulated walls, most likely, uh, concrete structure and so on, so on, so on. Um, the other thing is, is that you'll sometimes be able to influence the level of finishing of that property um, because they're still constructing it and they want you to maybe make it feel like home. So they'll be able to give you some, uh, or well, give you some influence in, for example, what kitchen you want to put in, where you want to put, for example, the extra power sockets, if you want to bath or not. So that's that's definitely an advantage. Um, the um, disadvantage is, is that you don't know what it's going to look like, what the actual property will look like. And um, of course, you'll see photos, you'll see sketches, you'll see, but Getting a feel for the place is different when you do it on paper versus when you actually move in. The light is so important, I believe. Um, it doesn't mean it's not a good idea. Like we've helped plenty of people out buying a home that was new built or that was under construction. Um, one other thing is, is that you need to be aware that you will incur double costs because you'll pay for something that doesn't exist yet and you'll pay in phases. Um, so first you'll buy the ground or you'll buy the ground lease um, and then you'll pay for every level of construction that's completed and um, that money needs to come from somewhere so that's come that comes from your mortgage um, so while you pay that money you'll still need to live somewhere um, which means that you have rent payments and you have mortgage payments um, Cesar can tell you all about that and can do calculations um, uh, to very to very detailed level of what you can expect to spend and I think it's very important to get that support there because um, um, that will well should influence your decision. Did I miss we, anything, Cesar? You like yeah, to add anything? Yeah, yeah, good job. No, no. Uh, uh, only thing I want to add is uh, we just published a blog on uh, our website and on uh, uh, IMX Pad uh, about this specific topic. It came out last week. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Um, and one more thing I'd like to add is is that when you buy a new build, you'll do you you'll not pay transfer tax. So yeah. the 2% is something you'll not incur when you buy a new build. doesn't matter how old you are in this case. Yeah. So you can be 50, buy a property as new build. And then um, please be mindful, though, that you'll buy it from the, uh, from the developer, right? Because if you buy it from a homeowner who hasn't lived in it yet, then it will be a different, a different story. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. 
Um, then uh, for you, Cesar, from Aranya again, uh, does the bank complete any pre-approval processes? Something that gives you a good indication about the mortgage before you actually find the property? Uh, no. Um, uh, that's the short answer. I'll give a bit of a longer answer. Um, that's why we have this process at our firm that we uh, prepare your case. Uh, 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 me and my colleagues know exactly how to get a mortgage approved. Um, uh, so when you work with us, it's not a pre official pre-approval, but uh, we're guaranteeing you that uh, we can get the job done. Um, another thing that's good to know, uh, so we work on a, a no cure, no, no pay base. So if we cannot get the job done, you don't have to pay us. Uh, that's why it's even more important for us to prepare your case so we know what the outcome is going to be. So that's the pre-approval you can uh, get. Okay. All right. Um, then, uh, well, back to you, uh, Kimo, uh, from, uh, from Martin. How much or what sort of bargaining power does being a cash bidder offer? Hmm. So um, sellers want a sense of security and they'll want to know that you can move forward with uh, with the purchase because it has happened quite often that somebody submits an offer and he says, well, I need a mortgage. And, um, and then it turns out that, especially if they don't get support, they've miscalculated, then they're not getting support from mortgage advisor. They only go to the bank as soon as the offer is accepted. And it turns out they're not gonna get their mortgage. Sellers don't want that, especially if they've made plans themselves. Selling agents don't want that. They want a party that is sure about what they wanna do. And if you have cash, there's two things you can give the seller. The security that you move forward and speed as well, because you can say, hey, when we sign the purchase contract, I could move in in a week or two weeks or three weeks. Some sellers, of course, need a little bit of time to get their stuff in order, but um, especially properties that uh, have been vacated because the seller maybe lives abroad or has rented it out for a while, uh, they'll be keen to get a short timeline. So you can use the fact that you have or pay, pay in cash to your advantage um, because you have speed and security at your side. Um, of course, part of the uh, security is also, um, no, let me rephrase that. Let's say you don't have the full amount of cash, but you have 10, 20, 30% in cash. That still allows you to play around a little bit with giving the seller that sense of security. Um, one way to do that is saying that, okay, hey, we don't need to get the full mortgage on the amount that we've offered, we'll only need a percentage. Or if you wanna take it to a more higher level, you can say, we're very secure about the fact that we can get a mortgage because we have enough cash. We're not gonna put in any clause that says that we need a mortgage to move forward. So we'll move forward. The only downside is that uh, to, um, to just having a part in cash that you can't speed up the process anyhow, but um, um, it's still more attractive than people that have to pay the full amount with their mortgage. So um, yeah. One, one small thing to add, uh, even if you have the cash financially, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you're borrowing against 1.5. Um, if you put your money uh, uh, to work, then uh, I can guarantee over the long term you can get a better return than 1.5 percent per year. So that's uh, the, the, the downside of using uh, your money. Okay. Um, then, um, well, we'll stay with you, Cesar. How difficult is it uh, to actually get permission of the bank to rent out? And what are the conditions? Uh, most banks don't offer, uh, will not give you permission. Um, when you look at the current market, there are only two banks that have a um, feature within their product to switch from uh, uh, being be having a residential mortgage to, to a buy-to-let mortgage. Um, I don't know if this answers the question. So um, uh, it would mean in nine out of 10 cases or 98 out of 100 cases, you would need to refinance your mortgage and go to another bank. Um, and then um, just a bit of insight, mortgage application. Uh, the bank is looking at three topics. One, uh, who is the client? Where are they from? What is their background? Um, so who, who is the client and do we want to do business with this client? Two, what is the client's financial position? So income, expenses, assets, debts. Third topic is the property. 
How is it maintained? What is the value? Is there a, an owner's association that's healthy? Um, uh, those types of details. When you look at buy to let, it's completely the other way around. So first, the bank looks at the property. What, what is the value? What is the expected rent? And then they look at your income expenses and if they want to do business with you. Uh, so expected rent is uh, the, the most important. Um, and there is a lot, there are a lot of rules and regulations about uh, renting a home. Uh, again, tenants are well protected. It also means that you cannot rent out your uh, 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 home, uh, for example. It could be, there could be a case where you could not rent out your home for the price that you want to rent it out. Uh, so that's good to consider when deciding uh, uh, if you want to and if you should rent out your home. Okay. All right. Clear. Then um, uh, for you, Kimo, question from Petra. Uh, what is actually the difference between a buying consultant, so for example, Alana, um, and a, um, a real estate agent? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so the real estate agent, like I mentioned, most often works at a uh, real estate company. And what they do is they offer both services for helping people buy a home, but also for helping people sell their home. Um, currently, it's a seller's market. So it's much easier to sell a property. So what we experience is, is that the priority and their time goes to the people that want to sell their property versus people that want to buy a property um so that's that's the first foremost thing the other thing is is that i believe that uh, the business that we're in is not so much the real estate business it's actually helping people find a home and feel at home uh, so that's a much bigger social aspect to it uh, the other thing is, is that we've been able to because we've been specialized and focused on helping people buy a home we've been able to build our network right so we've invested a lot of the relationships with all the different uh, parties that are focused on selling as well and they know us they trust us that whenever they see an offer from us that uh, makes sense um, uh, but most likely they will uh, get a higher priority than offers that are for example without agents or from other agents that just don't take it that seriously um, the other thing is i think we're just nice so <laughs> i think that's this is an important part as well because it's going to be a um, uh, uh, i wouldn't call it necessarily a roller coaster but it's going to be a uh, an interesting time, especially in this, the last quarter, um, I'm not sure what's in the water, but something has happened where people are just going nuts ballistic. And what we do is we're kind of like that buffer between uh, between you and that crazy world, make sure that you don't get this hard. Again, maybe a private story. Um, when I started off um, 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 buying a property for myself, and my partner, I wasn't in this business. Um, I think I had six or seven offers rejected. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing um, and it kind of disheartened me a little bit. And at some point I was like, you know what, I'm not going to let that happen. And so we changed strategy, we changed course and now, God forbid, look, we had our first offer accepted afterwards. Um, but that was a market that was completely different from the market that is now. And what we try to do is we try to make sure that you don't make the mistakes that I make when I was actually looking for a home. And that whenever, for example, uh, uh, something comes up that could disarm you will be that buffer to make sure that you actually still stay with us and uh, still are happy in the process and actually um, help or manage to find that home so um yeah th those are i think three most important things did i miss anything um i think that the fee is an important one right so most agents charge a percentage they charge one or two percent off the bridge price um they're a little bit more old-fashioned um also in their in their way of working i don't want to talk badly about uh, the real estate agents because i think that the majority of them are great guys, but I think there is a stigma or there's kind of like this identification with a very fast, like partly criminal real estate agent. I don't, I don't think that that is the kind of person you want to work with. I don't think that the majority of them are like that, but I do think that there's room for disruption um, there and there's room for people that approach it in a different way. I consider ourselves um, a different real estate agent, a different type of breed. Um, um, I don't consider ourselves a real estate agent, but more consultants in that sense. Oh, that's your question. Definitely. definitely. Okay. All right. Well, then um, I have another one for you, um, Cesar. Uh, Roxana asks, is it possible to get a mortgage with revenue earned in another country? 
Um, it depends a bit on the other country. Um, and it depends a bit on how it's earned. So what do you do to earn them? So it, it, this, um, this question raises a lot of other questions. <laughs> um, and maybe this is more something in a one-to-one -one, uh, call. Okay, sounds good. Cool, then, um, a, uh, well, back to you then, Kimo. <laughs> uh, question from- uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's definitely, uh, otherwise you guys get run out of breath and I don't want that. <laughs> um, a question from, uh, from Kay. Um, after I sign the purchase contract, I understand that I have a three days uh, cool off period. Um, do I get the keys right after signing the purchase agreement or how does that normally work? Um, so you don't get the keys after signing the purchase agreement because you still need to get a mortgage or you still need to pay the money and you still need to make sure that you become the owner. You get the keys once the transfer deed is signed and most likely the mortgage deed is signed. But first you'll sign that transfer deed, then you'll get the keys and most likely then you'll sign the mortgage deed. And that's going to happen on the final day. So um, uh, you first have to go through all the hoops and then when everything is arranged and paid and settled, then uh, uh, on the day that you've agreed to with the seller, you'll become the proud owner once you've signed that transfer deed. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then I have another one for you. Uh, it's from, uh, from <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought, from, uh, from Stefi. Um, uh, she or he is living in the Netherlands by her, him or herself and wants to buy a house. Uh, well, her or his husband is living abroad and is uh, neither interested in moving uh, to the Netherlands, nor taking part in the mortgage or buying. Uh, does that mean he or she has to buy and sign everything by him or herself? So I think this is this is two sided. One is you can actually purchase the property, and the other one is like, do you need a mortgage? And maybe says you want to start off with what implications being married while your partner lives abroad has on a mortgage. Yeah. Um... When you, yeah, I, I, okay. When you sign the purchase agreement, the bank is following what is in the purchase agreement. Um, uh, one of the things, one of the details in the purchase agreement is what your marital status is. Um, um, you're married, so it will say that you're married. And then the bank is going to ask uh, why uh, you're buying it alone. Uh, obviously, we're going to tell them uh, 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 your partner that that your partner is living abroad uh, and your partner is not planning on uh, moving over. Um, then they will ask us uh, to see uh, what your partner is uh, uh, earning, what your partner is paying on rent or a mortgage. Um, just to make sure that you have the means to uh, keep up with the mortgage payments because that's the uh, that that's their goal they want to have a long-term relationship with you uh, they want to secure uh, that uh, you're not uh, getting uh, too much credit uh, too much of a loan that you cannot afford and therefore they're, they're going to ask these questions um, so that is the implication on the mortgage side um, even though your, your partner is not signing anything, um, you need to answer uh, these types of questions. So it will take slightly longer uh, than um, yeah, normally, but it's not something that we cannot prepare or it's not something that we cannot foresee. So that's the mortgage. Yeah, so technically it means you can buy the property then yourself, but please bear in mind that um, sure in which country you're married and under what conditions you're married um buying buying a property in a different country while still being married without a prenup uh, might mean that uh, uh, your partner has a right to uh, uh, or has a percentage in the property so that's what's good to look out for as well besides the mortgage aspect but um yes you can actually sign for the papers yourself and uh, put in your name okay all right cool um, then for you, Cesar, uh, from, uh, from Timothy, um, so how is there, what is the largest uh, mortgage amount you can obtain given your regular salary? Is there like a uh, fixed five times your salary uh, thing? Um, 
the the more you earn the more you can borrow <laughs> so it's it's a multiplier that works two ways and it depends on your income um if you want to be on the safe side uh, 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 uh your income multiplied by four annual income that is multiplied by four that's the amount that you can borrow However, uh, five could also be possible. 5.5 could also be possible. So there, there is a bit of a range depending on how much you earn. Okay. All right. Um, then uh, for you, Kimo, question from Petra. What happens if I bid on an apartment or a property and my bid get ac gets accepted, but I do not get enough mortgage from the bank? So if you don't get enough money from your bank, then it depends a little bit on what you have in the purchase contract. Let's say you submitted an offer and you said, I need to get a certain amount from my bank to move forward. And if the bank doesn't give you that amount, technically you have the right to pull out of the deal. Um, you also have the right to kind of like find money somewhere else and maybe make up for the remainder. Um, but you have that right to pull out if you put it in the purchase contract. If you have not put the clause in the purchase contract stating that if you don't get your mortgage for this amount, you can pull out, technically it becomes a trickier issue because by the purchase agreement, you've committed to moving forward, even if you don't get the mortgage or if you don't get enough money for your mortgage. So then there's several things. Well, again, you have the option, of course, to find cash somewhere else. So maybe friends and family will borrow some of the amount for, uh, or will lend you some of the amount. Um, the other thing is, is that you can pull out, but then the seller um, has the right to uh, fine you for up to 10% of the purchase price. So that's, that's a tricky bit. Um, is there any other uh, implications there? Um, so I would advise to get, go to kind of like a mortgage advisor because if one bank doesn't give you enough money, maybe another bank will. Um, so please bear in mind that trying once or trying with directly with your bank is not always the uh, the right way to do it. Um, I, therefore, I would advise you to go somebody that can at least support in this sense. Because if you go to a bank directly and they say no, you're not going to say yes to any other product. So um, then you would need to go to a mortgage advisor anyway. So um, that's my response. I hope that answers the question. Yep. Cool. All right. Then I have a question from Alex for you, Cesar. Um, if you took a mortgage for, let's say, 10 years, could you pay it off completely at any point in time before the 10 years? Um, Are you free to do so? Uh, that depends a bit on uh, the bank. Uh, so most banks um, offer a possibility to, uh, to pay off early. Uh, and usually that's around that's 10% uh, of the original principal. For example, if you borrow 500k, then every year you could repay uh, 50k without a penalty. Um, so in 10 years, you could be done. Uh, yeah, uh, but there are also banks that offer 15%, 20%, 25%. So if if that's an important feature, then we'll look into that. We'll see if we can get a, get that mortgage approved for you at that specific bank with with that specific feature. Um, and then we move forward and uh, uh, get it done. So uh, if that's a, a wish that's important to you, then we make sure that uh, uh, can uh, make use of it. Cool. All right. Um, then I have a question from Nikita for you, Kimo. Um, how do you actually find out the market value of the house during the bidding process, given that you do not have a buying agent? So one of the one of the um platforms you can use is the land registry, the cadastro we call it in Netherlands. That's a way, there's also a, a platform called Welter Living. They also offer data from the cadaster. Um, so you, you can find several sources. How to look at it is a different way. And sometimes a little bit of a puzzle to actually um, navigate it, but there are ways to actually finding those documents. Um, yeah, I hope it answers your question. Can, can I give my two cents on uh, yeah, sure, that? Of course. Uh, um, what I what I know and what my team notices is if um, a client uses uh, 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 expert housing network or, or, or another agent, everything, the entire mortgage application is more smooth simply because um, uh, everything has already, so all the details already have been shared either with us or with you as their client. 
Um, and it takes away a lot of the stress uh, that uh, you could have when buying when, when you buy a home. So I advise to use an uh, uh, to, to use an agent. That's that's basically it. Uh, I know Kimo is saying he's not an agent, and we are saying the same. But uh, for me, you are. You're helping the client. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, uh, but it simply having someone on your side explaining. Uh, how it works, uh, what the legal documents in Dutch say, um, managing expectations on all sides, um, that takes away a lot of stress. And uh, it's it's uh, uh, even though you're 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 going to spend a bit of money, uh, it's 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 worth uh, uh, spending it uh, because uh, uh, having a good night's sleep is uh, also worth something. So that's uh, my two cents. Thank you. Cool. Very well, thank you service. for that indeed. Um, then uh, I'm going to stay with you, Cesar. <laughs> Things like this keep coming out and <laughs> you're yeah. out for the next hour. Um, it's a question from uh, Sumi. Again, please excuse my pronunciation. Uh, how much extra do I have to pay to convert my mortgage into uh, from a residential mortgage into a buy-to-let mortgage? Um, it depends a bit. Um, and that's not the answer you were probably hoping for. Um, um, so when you leave your bank, it could be depending on uh, uh, the contract that you have that you need to pay a penalty. Um, and how much that penalty is depends on the contract. So that's why I'm saying it depends. Uh, besides that, uh, you'll need to uh, work with uh, a mortgage advisor. Uh, you need to go to the notary one more time um, and you need a, a, a new valuation report. So looking at fees you're spending 4k and the penalty of the bank but how much the penalty is um, is uh, unknown until someone calculates that for you and that's something that the advisor for example can do okay all right um then um i have a question from chemo um are there any places or areas uh, in the Netherlands where you now recommend to buy a place? <laughs> Let's start with the, uh, with the areas. So I currently think that the, the, the capital is, is quite expensive um, and there's, there's a lot of competition there. I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. When the borders open up, I think we'll see more people flock towards the, the major cities. So um, I think there's there's a few cities that are a good buy. Um, I think Rotterdam is on its way up, but I think that still very uh, has a, a lot of potential. Eindhoven um, also still well, it's, it's it's relatively crazy there at the moment as well. But I believe that it's a uh, it's a good place to buy because there's a lot of buzz around the um, what they call it Brainport. There's a lot of big companies there, so I think that currently with travel restrictions will it's more of a um, it is less competitive than it will be when the borders open up again and we'll see people again travel a lot to Eindhoven um, that I also believe that some of the more um, more rural areas um, where there is uh, uh, more green around are definitely good investments at this point um, if not uh, for now then maybe in the future also to rent it out uh, because I, well, what we've seen is that some of the um, um, well because people couldn't travel that much anymore, they started looking for a place to go to in the country. Um, and I think that, that is something uh, something worth looking into as well. Um, Utrecht is is as crazy almost as Amsterdam. I would consider the same for, for Haarlem and uh, some far places like Hilversum and so on. When it comes to neighboring cities of, of Rotterdam, um, I would say that there, the difficulty is, is that some of the, these hubs are very attractive. Um, but it doesn't necessarily spill out to some of the neighboring areas there as much as it does, for example, with Amsterdam or with Eindhoven. In Rotterdam, I think that's the case a little bit. I think The Hague is also a good investment. Also look at the, um, uh, the, the um, again, like what I mentioned, the facilities around how much space you have. And I think that moving forward, space will be important. I think that one of the things that we saw when we came out of um, um, the, the Second World War, I don't want to compare this with the Second World War, but one of the things we've seen is that coming out of, um, out of crises is that people want more space, they want more light, they want more 
room to breathe. And I think we'll see that as well in the next couple of years. Um, so um, a place where you can get a property with a little bit more space will be a um, uh, will be better investment than um, small studios and so on. Um, of course, you'd still need to be able to afford it. Um, so have a look at that as well. But um, um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. It's very difficult for me to go into all of the areas, all of the cities, all of the neighborhoods. But if you have any specific question, uh, please book in a one on one and we'll be happy to share our thoughts on those. Most definitely. All right, uh, cool. Then a uh, question from you, Cesar, um, since you worked at ABN. They say if you ask uh, for more than 700K, uh, you have to go through a commission who will decide if you get uh, uh, can get more. Can you tell us a bit, little bit more about that? Yeah. So uh, I didn't mention it before, but um, so one of the uh, impact of COVID-19 on the mortgage market is that if you buy a home of 750K or more, and you want to borrow 750k or more, then uh, the mortgage application is going to uh, the credit commission of, 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 the, of that bank. Uh, uh, so we work with uh, 28 banks in total for residential mortgages. And uh, I think 20 of them uh, uh, stopped providing mortgages for uh, 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 or for for mortgages uh, more than 750k so that is a a, a big uh, a part of the pie that doesn't uh, 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 yeah where you cannot apply for a mortgage anymore if you buy a home of 800k for example um, so yeah that's that's that background story so uh, uh, if you buy a home of 750k or more then the bank's going to ask a lot of more questions uh, and it's more difficult to uh, get the uh, mortgage approved. Um, and so I mentioned at the start, we're not only a mortgage brokerage firm, we're also a mortgage advisory firm. Um, in those specific instances, uh, banks are going to ask us what happens if the client gets disabled? How did, they, how did the client mitigate that risk? Um, and we need to answer those types of questions. So it's not only about what you're currently earning, but also looking into those types of scenarios. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. All right. Um, then um, a question from Evelina for, uh, for Chemo. What does the up to two months mean for submitting the issues after the transfer? Is it always two months or can it be less? No, so I think it's a reasonable time. Um, and what is good to know is that as a buyer, um, if you find out about something, you technically have the obligation to prove that it's uh, that was already damaged when you moved in. So the longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes to prove that because the seller could just say, sorry, um, this was working. We, had actually, we actually had a case where a dishwasher broke a week after the client moved in. And the dishwasher was old, so it was bound to happen at some point. But the client was like, hey, sorry, but it was working uh, when we viewed the place. Now it's not working. It was actually working a few days in as well. And then it broke down. Whose liability is it? Well, it becomes very difficult to say that the landlord should inform the uh, the buyer about the seller should inform the buyer about the dishwasher potentially breaking within one week. Um, so that's where uh, the the gray area lies a little bit. But the longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes to prove. Because let's say the dishwasher broke two months in and it worked perfectly the first two months, then it becomes even harder for the for the buyer to prove that. So don't wait, um, make sure that you list all the things and share them with the seller as soon as possible. Um, and then uh, most likely you'll have a better case than when you'll wait until two months after you've moved in. For them. And I understand that some of you, they'll want to do renovations, they'll want to paint everything. So you're not practically use all of the equipment once you've moved in. Um, so that's why a reasonable time is um, uh, uh, stayed and, we consider two months to be a reasonable time. Okay. All right. Um, then um, uh, for you, Cesar, um, can you explain how tax relief works on mortgage? Um, how does it relate to the 30% ruling, for example? Uh, it does not have any relation to the 30% ruling. Uh, okay. So that's, um, yeah, how it works. So you're paying interest on your uh, mortgage um, a part of the interest that you pay uh, 
can be deducted from uh, your, your income. Um, your employer is paying the income tax uh, for you. Uh, and at the end of the year, so let's say, and I'll give an example, uh, you earn 70K per year, you paid 5K on uh, interest uh, on your mortgage, uh, your employer paid uh, income tax for that 70K of income that you have. Uh, however, uh, uh, so you can deduct the interest that you paid and I'm oversimplifying it right now, but um, so you paid 5K on interest, you're earning 70K. So what the tax authorities say then is you, you only should have paid income tax on 65K. Um, your employer already paid your, your income tax and therefore you're getting back uh, a part of uh, what, what has been paid already for you. So that's how it works. Cool. All right, then I have another question for you, uh, Cesar. Um, if we have an existing mortgage loan in um, uh, our country, another country, does it decrease our capacity to get a mortgage loan here? Uh, it depends on, um, so if, if, if you have a, a tenant in that uh, home that you own uh, abroad, um, then we could look into uh, what you're paying on your mortgage and how much uh, you're getting back from the tenant. Uh, uh, so that's, that's uh, how it impacts your, your new mortgage application. Um, when we calculate how much you can borrow, we, we look at how much you can spend every month. I'll give an example. If you can spend 2,000 euros on a mortgage uh, every month, However, you're already spending 1,200 uh, 1, abroad, then it means that you can only spend 800 on a mortgage in the Netherlands. Because again, a bank wants to have a long-term relationship with you. They want to make sure that uh, the mortgage payments are affordable uh, and you're not taking out too much uh, credit. Okay, All right. Then, uh, then I have a question from Mark. And Mark has a question for Chemo. If the seller cannot back out of the sale, what is the advantage to the buyer of giving the 10% deposit? Is it usually required as part of the sale agreement? Yeah, so, so the 10% deposit is not uh, of any benefit to the buyer. Mm -hmm. It gives the seller security that, let's say you walk off that, because it's easier to track somebody that owns a property in the Netherlands mm -hmm. because you know where they live um, versus yeah. somebody who wants to buy and could just escape the country so um, the seller wants some sense of security and they'll request you to make that 10 percent deposit or give a bank guarantee in a specific period of time so it's not for the buyer there's no benefits there um, so yeah be mindful of that um, maybe one thing to mention is that if you decide to pay it in cash do keep in mind that there's a negative interest um, at the moment so you'll pay uh, you'll pay some extra money i think it's what one euro for every 70k per day um, something like that so, um, um, but um, yeah, that's the only thing to keep in mind. So there's no positive things about that 10%. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, okay, then, uh, then another one for you, Kimo. Uh, if my partner and I buy a house together um, and we decide to split up in the future, what will happen if one of us wants to keep the house and the other wants to sell it? Mm. Um, well, hopefully that doesn't happen. I hope <laughs> exactly. we stay together uh, to the very end. Um, if you decide to split up and uh, one wants to keep and one wants to sell the house, that's a, that's, a, that's a tricky bit. You have to come to some some kind of agreement at some point, especially if you both own part of the home. Um, so that's something that you'll probably fix with either a mediator or something else. There's, there's of course, several ways of doing this. Um, your partner could buy you out if he wants to stay in the property um, or um, he could partly maybe pay rent or something like that. Uh, we haven't had this happen before, um, but there are, there are several ways of allowing someone to continue to live in it um, while you get either bought out or you get some kind of remuneration for, for owning the property partly. Um, if, you, if you can't come to an agreement, um, then I would definitely be advised to get a mediator in and find a suitable, uh, suitable option. 
um, yeah, technically you need permission from the other half. So you can't sell it as an individual. Uh, you can't continue. Uh, well, you could continue to live in it and uh, sell it as an individual, but um, again, um, you need to find a way to um, to solve that. Hope it doesn't doesn't happen, eh? Be, <laughs> exactly. be kind to each other. Get a big house. Get an extra room and a garden <laughs> and a dog. <laughs> get it all. <laughs> um, all right. I have a question for you, Cesar, from uh, Roxana. Um, by the way, in the meantime, I will have to put my charger in. So please take your time to answer this question. <laughs> um, is there a minimum period that you need to be employed in the Netherlands in order to get the mortgage approved? Oh no! This is <laughs> yeah. What's the short answer? This is all right. And let me. I have I have five percent left. So go ahead. <laughs> um, no, grab the charger, Lido. Yeah, right. grab the charger. I'll uh, give me two seconds. <laughs> yeah. Um, it depends on the bank. Um, there are banks that allow you to uh, 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 already have a mortgage application approved um, as soon as you land. Uh, however, uh, worst case, uh, so we work with 28 banks. With some of them, you can only get a mortgage, uh, depending on where you're from. So if, if you're from an EU country versus a non-EU country, but with some of those uh, lenders, if you're from a non-EU country, you need to live in the Netherlands for at least five years. Um, that's worst case. Um, uh, uh, you have a lot of choice when it comes to um, uh, 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 if, if you've been in the Netherlands for at least six months, uh, nine out of 10 will uh, approve your mortgage application. I hope this was long enough. You made it. Yeah. <laughs> you got a little bit of a blue glow around you. Uh, that's a, that, that's some power you got there. Little. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's the, the freshly charged. I think. Yeah. It's, uh, that's helping. Um, cool. All right. Let's see. Um, I have a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, I think this can be for either um, of you. Shall I use my own funds to pay the down payment or the bank um, that will provide the mortgage will pay it in its entirely? So we're talking about that 10% down payment. I think so too. Yeah. Uh, or the deposit. Well, technically you're not obliged to pay, pay a down payment, but the 10% deposit is what the seller will actually request from you. Um, again, uh, maybe good to know is that to get a bank guarantee costs some money. Not always. Cesar, maybe you could share a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, a couple of banks charge, uh, don't charge you for a bank guarantee. A couple of banks do charge you. Some uh, charge a fixed fee, a couple of hundred euros. Uh, some work with a percentage. Um, yeah, so it, it, it depends a bit. Okay. Um, so I think the, the, the way of looking at it is, because um, what's gonna happen is, let's say you pay the 10% in cash, then you'll incur the negative interest rate, rate um, depending on when you have the transfer. I would look at that. Um, and the other thing is, is that like, how much did you buy the property for? Let's say you bought the property for a lot over the value of the property and you were going to put up cash anyways, then, um, I would advise to actually use that cash for the 10% deposit because you wouldn't have, to, well, it depends of course, right? If the bank offers it for free, then you can keep it in your pocket for a little bit longer because you'll incur that negative interest. So touch base with your mortgage advisor about this. If you do have to pay a couple hundred euros, it could be advisable to actually pay the 10% in cash. Um, I'll to answer your question a little bit. Again, there's no down payment you have to make on a, on a mortgage, but the 10% will be required from the seller, which will be deducted at the end of the year. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, another question from Roxana, um, and also for you, Cesar. Is there a minimum period that you need to be employed in the Netherlands in order to get a mortgage approved? It depends on your contract. So let's say you arrived, you, um, I'll give an example. You, you, you were working for a big corporate in um, Italy, um, and that corporate uh, uh, sends you to the Netherlands. Uh, you already had a fixed contract, indefinite contract, you still have an indefinite contract, then uh, you don't need to be uh, employed. So then in such a scenario, you can already get a mortgage approved when you land. However, uh, if you just started your job, 
uh, then it depends on a couple of factors. One is, do you have a trial period? If so, how long does that take? Um, uh, and then it depends on if your employer is willing to uh, 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 state or confirm that as soon as your current contract ends, that they will extend it for, uh, for an indefinite contract. Um, so yeah, okay. that's something we can check for you. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, then um, uh, another question for you, Kimo. Um, what are the average uh, monthly maintenance fees? And are there any other fees um, or, or taxes from the municipality uh, that we should keep in mind? Yeah, good question. Um, so when it comes to maintenance fees, um, like it depends a little bit on that. On the property itself of course but there are several recurring fees that you'll pay one is when you buy a property um, and you buy a property as part of an owner association then you'll incur owner association service fees uh, that's a fixed amount that you'll pay on a monthly basis it depends on how big the owner association is how uh, luxurious the property is if it has a garage if it has an elevator all that stuff there'll be a fixed amount and it should be in, you should be informed about that before you of course buy the property um, then you'll have municipality taxes. We're talking about um, sewage tax, waste tax, uh, water and stuff like that. Um, that is a fixed amount as well, and that's annually. So you'll get those bills somewhere in March, sometimes a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit later. And you'll pay them on an annual basis. They're a couple hundred bucks each. Um, and then you'll have property tax as well. Property tax is linked to the WOZ value of your property. Um, and that is given to you by the municipality on a yearly basis. The WZ value, it's always with old data. So most of the time it's with data that's a year, year and a half old. So it most likely will be lower than the actual amount that you bought the property for, which is good. If it becomes much higher than contested, um, but the amount that you're paying property tax is 0 0.003 something um, times the, um, the WZ value. Um, what else you should be taking into account too is homeowner tax. Um, most likely you'll not see this amount because What's going to happen is, is that at some point at the end of the year, you'll um, have to file for your taxes and then you'll get a tax benefit for the interest rate, like it says a men's deduction. Um, the amount of homeowner tax will be deducted from that benefit. So you'll not see, um, you'll not see that as an actual bill. Um, so um, um, yeah, that's good to take into account. Did I miss anything? No. I think that's it. Those are the taxes. Okay. Um, those are the amounts that you'll pay on a monthly NA. Uh, and then, of course, you have the maintenance of the property itself, but um, that is a little bit uh, depending on the property itself. Cool. Oh, one more thing, maybe ground lease. Um, <laughs> so, some properties are on ground that is not owned by the uh, people living in the building, it's owned by the municipality. If there's ground lease and it happens more often with some of the newer areas in, near the capital or um, we, we don't see it very often in, um, uh, in some of these neighboring cities, but um, um, you'll pay that uh, twice a year, you'll pay an amount, um, but that should also be clear. And that's it. Cool. All right, and then I have another question uh, for you, Kimo, uh, from, uh, from Victor. Um, so when do you actually start? What do you do first? Find a property, then make a bid on it, and then secure a mortgage? Or first you find out um, what your bor bar uh, borrowing power is and then yes. search for properties in your range. Yes, money, money, money first, because you <laughs> wanna make sure that you understand what you can borrow before you go on that market. You wanna make sure that you understand what you can spend maybe on top of uh, potential valuation uh, to secure the property. So talk to a mortgage advisor and then talk to a um, uh, to us or to a real estate agent. Um, so that's what I would do. Um, get a wish list, like write the things down that you uh, want in the property and then maybe make a kind of like a list of, of things that are deal breakers and a list of things that you are willing to compromise on um, because there might be a situation where you have to compromise on one or two things. Um, and then sign up to fund that, like get properties sent to you on a daily basis, right? Get out there and see what's on the market. Um, when you start to search and you actually view some properties, look at the neighborhood, look at these things. Um, but um, start off with talking to a mortgage advisor and start off talking to uh, to uh, somebody who can support you in the process. 
Okay. All right, cool. Um, then uh, moving on to you, Cesar, question from Ella. Um, Ella says, we bought a house um, or our first home in 2016. We plan to buy a new build, but it will take some time for the new build to be uh, well, to be ready. Can we apply for a, with brackets, second mortgage for the new build while still paying for the first mortgage? Um, yes, you can. Um, so uh, you're moving homes. Uh, you're, you're, you're not going to be the first one doing that. Uh, 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 what the bank is going to ask is, so you're going to use your income to buy your new home. Mm -hmm. However, during uh, the construction of your new home, you'll have two mortgages to pay. So the bank is, is uh, either wanting to see that your income is sufficient to pay for both mortgages, or they want to see uh, an expected uh, 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 date where the uh, when the property is finished uh, with the with the construction, uh, and you can live in it, um, uh, because then what you could also do is if you have sufficient savings, uh, let's say you're currently paying one thousand euros on your mortgage, and you know that your property is ready in twelve months. Then the bank wants to see 12,000 euros uh, on a savings account. So the bank knows that you can keep on paying both mortgages. All right, cool. Then um, I have another question uh, for, for you, Cesar. It's from Julia. Um, she asks, can my parents support me in buying the property? For instance, transferring some money to my bank account that I can then use to lower the mortgage uh, to pay for the house. Um, uh, parents can uh, donate money, that's not an issue. You can even borrow it uh, from your parents. However, uh, so when we, when we start the application, um, we'll, uh, we're going to look into uh, uh, the, 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 the money that you want to put in. The bank is going to ask uh, us questions, where is the money coming from? Uh, and they would like to see the movement on a bank statement. When they see that it's coming from your parents, for example, uh, 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 they would like, they want to know uh, if it's borrowed or not. Because again, if you borrow money, then it means that you can spend less on your new mortgage. Um, so I hope that answers the questions. If, if, if there is a, a specific situation, always feel free to contact us and we can think along. Okay, all right. Um, then uh, I have another question regarding the closing fees. I think this one will be for you, Kimo. Um, what if one partner takes out the mortgage and the other gets a personal loan? Is that possible for, uh, uh, for, for raising the, the capital for the initial costs? So that would then technically be on two separate profiles, right? Yeah, of course. You can you can take out a personal loan to pay off for the purchase fees. You can do that. Um, okay. I don't think you can do that um, with the same bank or anything like that. So you have to find a, uh, another uh, uh, money lender to uh, to pay for that. But um, you can do that. Cool. Mm -hmm. All uh, right. <laughs> there is a situation where it's um, so you have uh, the situation where things are. Where, where things could be possible. I don't know what someone means by partner. So this, this is raising- spouse. Yeah, their actual spouse. So I think they're, they're either a husband or wife. Yeah, okay. In that, so if, if, if it's a husband and a wife, then um, if you're married, then by law, and, and you're buying a home to live in, then by law, you need to buy it together. Uh, so there's no escaping that. And if you buy it together, then you're applying together and the bank is going to look into both of your uh, uh, financial positions. Uh, if it's boyfriend, girlfriend, then technically you don't have a marital status. However, if one buys it and will have all the benefits and the other is borrowing money just to pay for the fees, then I don't know if that's a, a smart decision. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
then um, um, I have another question for you, Kimo. It's, uh, it's again from uh, Julia. Uh, which area in the Netherlands uh, is in your period um, um, uh, a good investment considering the Brexit? So how will, will this influence Amsterdam, Rotterdam, for example? That's a good question. Um, I think that considering Brexit, like when Brexit happened or when it was announced, which was, uh, I can't remember anymore when it was announced, <laughs> but um, um, we saw that the majority of companies actually kicked into gear then. Um, I think that in 2019, we saw the biggest influx of people relocating and moving to the Netherlands. Um, so if you would ask me what the best area is now, or what the areas will be that will be most impacted by Brexit, um, I, I can't give you a straight answer. What I can give you is, is that some, uh, Amsterdam is, is still very popular because there's several things that happened. The European Medicine Agency moved to Amsterdam and that's kind of like a magnet for a lot of different, uh, different companies. We're also seeing more finance um, uh, companies move uh, to Amsterdam as well. But there's a strong competition going on with Paris, also Berlin and, and Amsterdam. Um, so um, um, I can't give you a clear answer on that because I believe that the majority of the effects of the Brexit have already happened and are behind us. Um, currently, if, if anything, um, it, it becomes a little bit more tricky to actually move from the UK to uh, the Netherlands because uh, uh, when it comes to visa or anything else, that, uh, uh, that makes it a little more complex. Um, but um, um, yeah, I can't tell you what the impact, for example, on Rotterdam would be from a, uh, from a uh, Harbor point of view, I don't necessarily feel that Rotterdam attracts a lot of international companies that usually used to be in uh, in, uh, uh, um, in in the UK. Um, I do understand that there's an extra level of complexity when it comes to um, moving goods in and out of the UK. So there could be a little bit of an upside there. Um, besides that, no, I can't give you any uh, any extra information on that. I don't see any extra impact when we look at the amount of um, people moving here from the UK, I don't see a, a special influx towards a specific area at the moment. Okay. All right. Um, then um, I'm uh, heading back to you, Cesar. A question from uh, from Gabriela. Can you get a residential mortgage and rent out a room within the property for let's say six months to one year without asking permission from the bank whilst you are also living in there? Uh why would you do that if uh, the bank allows you to uh, to rent out a room? I don't see Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's my answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why Why would you do something sneaky if the bank is uh, allowing you to do it? Yeah. Exactly. So maybe maybe, uh, re maybe rephrase the question. Um, yeah. Was it was it who answered it? Ella? Gabriella. Gabriela, in this case it's uh, it shouldn't be it's it's only the hassle of asking their permission which would be the barrier i guess yeah all right cool um then uh, moving on to uh, to another question from julia for uh, for you cesar um, besides the yearly gross salary including holiday allowance what other benefits or bonuses um for example, leasing a car, performance bonus. Um, we had the Christmas bonus last time. Um, would that be uh, considered into the calculation of the mortgage? Uh, it depends a bit on the bank's uh, risk profile. Mm -hmm. uh, so if um, uh, so, if a bank wants to take a bit more risk, they'll allow more uh, 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 types of income. Uh, and if a bank wants to be really uh, safe, then yeah, they don't allow that much. Uh, what's, what's good to know, depending on the bank's risk profile, uh, if a bank is really strict, then nine out of 10 times, they also have lower interest rates because they have a better por performing portfolio. Uh, yeah, so the, it, it has a, a benefits and pro it has pros and cons. Cool. All right. Um, then I have a question uh, that I think both of you can answer, but I'm going to uh, ask Kimo in this uh, in this regard. Um, if you have uh, 50k cash, for example, from parents abroad or, or, or 
whatever reason, do you need to prove where this cash came from? <clears throat> yeah, we have a, uh, a Dutch law that states um, for any kind of like capital injection or payment of above, was it 10K, I believe, yeah. you need to prove where the, uh, where the funds come from. And also, if it's sometimes below 10k, they'll ask questions about it. So, um, yeah, a proof of proof of income or proof of where the money came from is important. So, in this case, you would need to verify that the money came from from your parents or from somewhere. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, they'll also check some other things about um, whether you've been in the news or whether you're a high profile person. Um, but um, the majority of folks will be on where did the money come from. So. The notary will ask this question. We will ask this question, and I think Cesar will maybe also ask the question. Yeah. Um, so, um, so <laughs> prepare your answer. <laughs> exactly. We'll cross-reference check. What did she say, Cesar? Yeah. What, what, what's good to know? We're not only uh, asking the questions, but uh, uh, you also need to prove it. Uh, it's a, it's as easy as that. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then I have a question from uh, SJL. Uh, for you, Cesar, uh, does the bank ask for a life insurance to cover the mortgage in case the buyer dies before the payment? Uh, Nine out of ten banks don't don't ask for it. Um, however, depending on how much you want to cover, obviously, uh, and how old you are, and if you smoke. Uh, uh, but uh, so most of our clients are uh, around the or between the age of thirty and forty. Uh, Looking at how much they pay on uh, term life insurance, uh, it's five to six euros uh, per month to cover uh, 100 to uh, 200 K. Um, I think if you buy a home, uh, uh, so besides the bank not uh, obliging you, it could still be a wise decision uh, to, uh, to get life insurance uh, for, and if it's only for five, six euros. Mm not that uh, big of a deal. All right, good advice, thank you. Um, then, uh, well, back to you, uh, Akimo. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, we were talking about some neighborhoods and some, some areas that were interesting, uh, but is there a way to find out more about a specific neighborhood? If there are closed schools in the area, et cetera? That's a, that's a, that's a very broad question. Um... When, when it comes to facilities or amenities, I think that the first thing that you want to look out for is like just check Google Maps, right? But also be specific with your queries. There are several platforms that give you a little bit more data on specific areas. Um, we're happy to share them with you. Pop them in the pop them in the uh, in an email. Uh, by the way, maybe I should put up this um, this thing. Um, maybe this one. Send an email to us buying at ehn.works. And we'll be able to um, to share with you several of these links. Um, when it comes to data about about schooling, again, yeah, I think I think the easiest way is to look that up on Google. Like, what are the international schools in a specific area? Um, I know that the Amsterdam metropolitan area has a um, has a tool where you can look at some of the amenities and facilities. Um, I don't know if if the Rotterdam metropolitan area has that. I haven't heard of that before. Um, what you can also do is check some of the expert platforms for more information. But when you want to get into kind of like the details of the neighborhoods, then we'll be happy to share some uh, some platforms with you. Please bear in mind though that some of the data is a little bit old, right? Because uh, it's so detailed that it's not updated on a regular basis. That's the future, though. Eh? If you can get pretty good data on neighborhoods and on uh, stuff like that, I think that a lot of people will find that interesting. I, I, I know of a couple of websites that. Uh, offer this however I, I forgot it uh, I'll uh, look it up and maybe uh, 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 if I find out then uh, we could uh, we could uh, share it with you yeah. Yeah. definitely cool um, all right and then um, uh, another question for for you Kimo it's from uh, Nikhil uh, he or she asks if the house is not yet constructed but you have reserved the house uh, you have reserved the house, do you still have to pay the mortgage while it's being constructed? Yeah, so technically you don't reserve the house, you buy the house mm -hmm. and you pay off the house in installments. And for every installment that you pay, you probably get that money out of the mortgage, so you'll pay uh, for that amount. Um, so yes, technically the answer is yes, you'll pay for the amount that you've mortgaged during the, uh, during the process of paying off the house in installments. Okay. 
All right, um, then uh, for you, Cesar, question from Victor. Is it better to get a mortgage at your bank or uh, is it maybe uh, more smarter to, to um, well, go with a mortgage advisor in this case to, to uh, go personal shopping? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, uh, if if uh, um, if you want to get a better deal and ha have someone by your side that thinks along, uh, then it's better to go to a mortgage advisor. Uh, if you want to have more of a uh, a budget type of service. So it's just someone at the bank selling their product to you without uh, consulting you that much or without explaining that much, then it, it could be easier to go to your bank. But, uh, in the end, so we work with 28 banks. So we can also provide your own bank, uh, uh, but at least you'll have a better service and we'll explain why that is the better choice for you. Exactly. So you, you can offer more products. Yeah. It's always better to go to a mortgage advisor so you'll know why you're uh, getting the mortgage that you're getting. Okay. And if I can add my two cents to that, <clears throat> um, I believe that um, the, the paperwork itself is not just the, uh, uh, just the, the challenge, right? It's actually telling the story to the um, mortgage lender or the uh, mortgage yeah. provider. And I think that if you go to a bank, they'll just look at it very black and white. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to a mortgage advisor, well, first of all, they have multiple uh, lenders and multiple products, but they'll be able to tell your story in a much better way. So first of all, you'll probably get confirmation faster because um, um, they build relationships, mortgage advice and mortgage lenders are more comfortable with like getting uh, applications through uh, several mortgage advice. I wouldn't say all, by the way, um, they're not always good, but um, um, I think that that has an impact as well. And I think that one of the things that was asked earlier was about whether banks actually give pre-approval. Um, no, they don't. Um, but if you get support from mortgage advisor, they will, they'll be able to gauge if your uh, application will have a chance of being accepted and they'll feel comfortable saying, okay, yes, don't worry, you should be able to get a mortgage. If you, um, uh, of course, don't buy any crazy property or you don't go all out on your bid. Um, but um, um, I think that is very valuable. And that's why we like to work with this mortgage because um, it's kind of like a, a partnership, right? We ask them sometimes, okay, hey, how confident are you about this client getting a mortgage? Because we want to, for example, take out the finance clause because that makes the offer more attractive. And if I, if I go to a bank with that question, they'll be like, we're not going to share that information. We're not going to give any guarantees. We're a bank. We mitigate risk. We earn money on. So um, if we go to a mortgage advisor, if we go to Mr. Mortgage, they'll say, yes, we're confident about this fact uh, that they're going to get a mortgage. And that helps us in the process, right? So I think it's a two-way uh, two system. So um, yeah, that's my Thanks. Cool. All right. And uh, then we're down to the last two questions. Um, I am going to start with Cesar on this one. Um, we actually just got a third question in. So um, please, if you do have other questions, uh, pop them in the, the Q&A and uh, we'll, we'll answer them. Um, a question from Andrea. Um, you were talking about um, um, temporary contracts and how that impacts your mortgage. Um, how does extending a contract with only one year impact the mortgage? Um, so then it means simply uh, you have a temporary contract. We don't know what the future will bring. So in, in to put it a bit more blunt, the bank uh, wants to see your, your economic value. Uh, that means what is your track record? What have you earned uh, in the last three years? And that will give us, the bank, more security on how much you can earn. Um, so they will look at your track record. That's the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the implication. Okay, all right. Um, then I'm gonna stick with you uh, on this one. Um, anonymous attendee has a car loan in the Netherlands. How bad is the impact on the mortgage amount? <laughs> uh, it can be huge, uh, depending on uh, uh, what you're paying every month. Uh, uh, 
let someone check that for you. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. All right, and then uh, down to our last question. Um, <laughs> I should not have said that so quickly, uh, but hey, a uh, question for, for Kimo. Uh, can you come back to your own house after renting it out for a couple of years? Can you come back? So uh, it depends a little bit. Like if you if you have a residential mortgage still and the bank gave you permission to rent out for a short period of time, one or two years, then you're technically allowed to come back. If you got a buy to let mortgage out, then, um, and I'm looking at Cesar for this, you're technically supposed to rent it out, not yeah. living it yourself. Yeah. So if you want to move back in yourself, you probably have to remortgage it again and make it a residential mortgage to live in it yourself. Correct. Um, or you divorce and rent it out to your partner and then suddenly become the boyfriend or girlfriend of your partner, <laughs> partner again. No, 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 I'm just messing with you guys. Um, so um, yeah, those are the options. Cool. All right. Then I have uh, the last uh, final question. I think my favorite question uh, of the evening from Victor. So basically, to get the best service, one should hire a buying agent and a mortgage advisor, correct? Um, no, <laughs> let me be a little more specific. To get the best service, you need to hire Mr. Mortgage and Expert Housing Network. Exactly. Honestly, honestly it depends on, on how confident you are and what, what a buying agent do. It's not rocket science, but it will help you, especially in a market like this. Um, I, cannot, I cannot say the same for a... Um, or mortgage advisor, because I understand mortgages to some extent, extent, but I think that um, it's a little bit more of a complex product. Um, but um, um, yeah, I, I would I would talk to both of them, get an idea, get a feel for it, and I think that's the most important thing, right? Because people are in different stages, are in in different phases when it comes to the level of confidence. Maybe you've bought properties before, uh, and uh, you're like, I can do this by myself. Then. I don't want to tell you what you need to do if you if you're very confident, right? If you don't need any advice, and um, if you do feel like it's useful, have a chat with us. But also let us work for our money, right? So if you're not sure, book in a chat, and then if we can't convince you, um, if you don't feel like it's a valid value after the conversation, then don't do it. If you do feel, then we're happy to help out. Like it's quite busy as it is, um, so um, uh, yeah. And in the end, it has to fit and suit you. Definitely. All right, cool. That was it. Um, those were all the questions. Uh, all the questions that we had in the chat are also popped in the Q and A. So that's, uh, that's great. Um, thanks very much for that. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was my, my battery on my, my iPods just died. So uh, good timing. Um, thanks a lot, Ludo, for, um, for asking all the questions and answering some of those as well. I think we'll, uh, we'll start experimenting with that more in the, in the future webinars. Um, thanks, Cesar, for sharing your insights and information on all things mortgages. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around with us for, uh, for so long. Uh, I hope this actually helped you in maybe deciding whether you want to buy or how to approach the process or where to get support in. Um, if you have any further questions, um, please don't hesitate to book in a, an intake. It's not a 50 minute intake. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to just answer all the questions that you have, but it's for free. There's no strings attached. Again, let us do the work. Let us kind of like um, make sure that you feel confident about getting support. Um, it's a crazy market as it is. Don't do anything stupid. Don't just overbid by a ridiculous amount. Please stay a little bit sane. Get support on. This is the biggest investment that you'll probably make in a long time. So do your due diligence, get support on, and make sure that you're happy in the process. Um, the Netherlands is a beautiful country to live in. There's a lot of great places and cities to live in. There's plenty of room for everybody. For everybody and I think that. Um, you'll find a home that you'll love and you'll love it in this country as well. We're happy to support you. Um, we're, uh, we're ready for you when you are. Um, my name is Kimo. Thanks a lot. Have a <laughs> lovely evening, guys. Cool. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.